Our city council presentation mayor's designee this morning is Councilman Brandon Ellington. Please come with your presentation. Before I say anything, I'm gonna say all praise and glory be to God. Uh, the mayor told me I had 45 minutes to so be as precise <laughs> and concise as I can. <laughs> as I can be. Uh, on the start with what I just heard from Mr. Garrett though, when he said outside voices change us and also that we can always be better. I came here today to talk to you about culture, problems and solutions. So when we talk about improvements in the police department, when we talk about improvements in community relations, I think there's a separation from what I would call those in policy positions and those that are actually enforcing policy and enforcing laws and regulations. And this becomes a quagmire when it comes to community involvement. If the policies that the officers and the captains and the majors follow is not the policies that would create community connectiveness and community trust. And when I'm, what I'm talking about with that, when you look at East Patrol, Central Patrol and South Patrol, I know several officers, I know several ground officers, I know several officers that I have conversations with about what they would like to do, what they can't do, and where they're restricted. And then when I talk to constituents, there's always an apprehension of calling law enforcement for lack there of follow through. Some of that goes to policy. And, uh, and again, like I said, I'm gonna intermingle problems and solutions. So I'm gonna give you the, prob the problems first. Number one problem would be connectivity in the community and follow up when it comes to calls. Number two would be honest partnerships and increasing youth opportunities and partnerships. Uh, and also another policy uh, that the board can actually work on that would increase community uh, uh, participation would be a civilian review board. Why are these important? How could these policy recommendations simply be changed? When we talk about follow-up, in my neighborhood, I sell for 40th and Chestnut in between South Bend and Chestnut. There are several drug houses that I know are called on, but there's no follow-up. There's no follow through. Some of that may be external uh, 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 in investigations, et cetera. But a simple solution is to rework the civilian board or the community engagement board of the police department by creating a more palatable position for law enforcement to engage with the community in a non uh, apprehensive way, meaning walk the communities. One of the things that we do with the No More Excuses Coalition is actively walk neighborhoods, actively walk communities. That creates community trust. So when people see you out there, uh, they're more viable to talk to you. And it also helps to reduce some of the uh, issues that law enforcement can't necessarily immediately arrest somebody for. Example, somebody sitting on a vacant property selling drugs, but the vacant property is not necessarily a known vacant property. Law enforcement wouldn't necessarily be able to run up on that property, but engaging with the community, law enforcement would know operations of that facility. They would know when they can go to that facility and they would have a better chance of apprehending those that are committing crimes of youth programming. It's my understanding in the uh, research, the small research that I did that is $956,000 in uh, salary. And that would be from 21 to 22. And also another 300,000 in dare. The problem with this is I can't point to one youth program or one uh, youth in my district that attended programs. There are several facilities that these dollars could go to to enhance. And that goes again to policy. What we are actually putting in front of our law enforcement officers and what opportunities and avenues we're giving them to work in as far as community uh, building and community capacity. The C Civilian Review Board is another simple uh, fix that you guys can do. There is no uh, regulation in the state statute that would disallow the board who has exclusive 
exclusivity is the actual word that he used. Exclusivity when it comes to the police department. That will engage in all policy procedures and anything underneath the sun. The state and the city is actually absolved of the ability to create policy. So again, politics, policy, and enforcement. Since I've been on the council, politics, policy, and enforcement has been a weird commingulation that I've never seen before. Uh, at my time serving at the state, I'm used to working with law enforcement in the capacity that law enforcement understands that they're there to enforce the law, not to draft the law, not to write the law, not to create the law. But again, that goes back to the premise of administration. And when I say administration, I'm not talking about the patrol officers. I'm not talking about the captains. I'm actually talking about the people that write policy and dictate policy. Uh, so we should never have a point in which law enforcement and the community and then the elected officials are siding against each other. Because in the, the paradigm of how things are supposed to work is law enforcement is supposed to enforce the law, not to create the law. The uh, legislative branch, whether that's at the state or at the city or at the county, they're supposed to draft policy. <coughs> it should not be intermingled. So my whole request with the board today is to have more transparency uh, when it comes to engaging in the community, to actually take redrafting policy seriously because there is a divide between law enforcement and the community. But I understand that a lot of that is directives of what they can, what they can't do, and how they have to operate, which is a simple, a simple fix. I would suggest actually engaging with people from East Patrol, Central, and South Patrol that are actually on the ground and talk to them about some of the barriers that they have about interjecting in community, some of the barriers that they have when it comes to follow-up on certain criminal activity areas and not necessarily arresting folks. And that goes back to, again, changing the trajectory. There's been a few civilian police officers that I've met uh, that was extremely good. One was Matt Thomasak. I don't believe he's no longer with the police department. And I think some of that had to do with the uh, opportunities for growth. So in closing, I actually want to talk to the chief too, and I didn't just come here to beat on people, but it starts with you. You're the head. The last time I talked to you in a professional setting was on the city council meeting during the budget process. And I requested that you came in and talk to the council. You have still not came in and talked to the council. That was last year. So when we talk about visibility in the community, when we talk about apprehension in the community and not going into details of the case, but Malcolm Johnson and Ryan Stokes is something that has galvanized the community. And I've seen little motivation from law enforcement not to discuss the case but to at least address the underlying concerns of the lack thereof in the inner city. And again, uh, that falls on the chief. I believe that it is up to you to inspire more community desires from your officers to actually be out there in the community. And again, looking at these dollars for 956,000 for salaries and 300,000 for a DARE program, not talking about the people that administrate the program, but you guys have to do a better job of reallocating dollars. Now the fix for all of this, how can we actually help you guys increase the uh, budgetary opportunities to increase civilian police officers? How can we help you guys increase a resource factor for a civilian review board? How can we guys help you partner with more organizations in the community that are actually doing things? Well, we actually passed something. We passed the Office of Citizen Engagement, which would allow all DLJ dollars to be uh, 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 going to a contract service. So uh, through the Office of Citizen Engagement, there's uh, we passed the FTE, we passed the finance, we passed the dollars for it. What we failed to do was actually hire the person. So I'm asking the board to work with me and my office to not only give me or help me with somebody from the police department in which we can work for expanding grants, but then also help me to ensure that the city does what it's supposed to do. And now I'm talking to you, Mr. Mayor, and your uh, appointee, the city manager, and actually hiring that position so we can cr create that partnership. And we've already passed everything else. So I know you guys have some expertise when it comes to asset fortitudes, when it comes to other DOJ provisions out there, and you don't have the manpower. The community has an underlying understanding in the natural investment. There has been no bridge. And what I'm offering is my office and all of my political 
friends that I have to actually engage with you guys and help build that bridge. And again, we've already passed the infrastructure. So the office is already passed. The uh, fiscal dollars is already passed. Only thing we're lacking is a, a partnership between the police department, the city, and expanding our services. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Ellington. Uh, we have a uh, guest presentation today from Shot Spotters, and I'm going to ask um, Kevin Johnson, Ron Teachman, and Trish Lane if they will come with their presentation. Good morning. On behalf of myself, Ron, and Kevin, I'd like to thank the Board of Police Commissioners and the Police Department for inviting us in here to talk with you this morning. We have um, a couple of topics that we're going to talk with you about. Um, and one of them focuses primarily on the fact that, believe it or not, it has been nine years ago on October 1st that the Kansas City Police Department went live with their shot spotter deployment. In that time, our service offering, our company, all of what we do has changed. The way we onboard our customers today, the way we train them, and the way we speak with them about best practices is all different since that original implementation. So what Ron will speak about first, for those that don't know, is he's going to speak a little bit about why people bring ShotSpotter to a city. Then he'll talk a little bit about how it all works. Uh, um, just to give you that kind of same foundation and overview. After that, Kevin is going to talk about how he works with different clients all over the country to bring best practices into a city so that our customers get the maximum value and benefit from their installed ShotSpotter system. Um, he's got a lot of different ways he can help you, and all of the things that Kevin and Ron talk about here this morning do not involve any additional expenditure on the part of the Board of Police Commissioners, the Police Department, or the city. So with that, I'm gonna turn you over to Ron. Thank you, Trish. What I'd like to do following up to Trish's comments is first and foremost, thank you very much for the time you've allowed us to come here and, and meet with you. We appreciate that very much. Uh, let me just briefly introduce myself and Kevin will do the same. I, think some of the comments I make, especially during Q&A, uh, need to have this background. I've been with the company six years, 30 years in law enforcement prior to joining the company. Eight of those years, I was a chief of police in two cities, New Bedford, Massachusetts, South Bend, and I've installed ShotSpotter in both cities. So I've overseen the procurement installation process, the adoption by the officers, establishment of best practices, and then socializing it in the community. And I welcome your questions. Interrupt me if you like now at any time or at the end of this presentation. Trish asked that we spoke about the why. Why do we think this is of value? And that is because reality is it may happen tonight in some neighborhood in KC, but there'll be gunshots. And without shot spotter, more than likely the police department would not even know about the event. Most gunfire goes unreported. In fact, and checked in last September, we did an analysis of your CAD computer aided dispatch information. And not only were you not getting most of the gunfire, reports show that it was about 6.6% coming through. So not even the 20% average, uh, it was much lower. Which means that if you don't know about the shooting, in particular if you don't know where it happened, when it happened and what happened, the chance of getting to a victim to save a life the chance of talking to witnesses, the chance of solving that case is far less than 20%. And again, those are national averages. Uh, AC is a bit lower. So with that, what happens? Gunfire unattended continues. Shooters feel emboldened to continue. And that increases your likelihood of homicides and non-fatal shootings. Let me just take a moment and speak to what 
a resident in Kansas City may be experiencing, particularly if there's not shot spotter, not a comprehensive response. Awakened by gunfire in the middle of the night, comfort a child who's crying, and then at some point go to the window waiting for a squad car response. They expect a police response, as do citizens across the country, because they project omniscience to the police based on their experience watching cop shows where every crime gets solved and every bad guy gets arrested. So as they peer out their window, if they think the police know, but the police don't show, what might they think about their police department? And I'm just speaking from my own experience as a chief twice, you might think the police don't care. So we can give the police the opportunity to respond comprehensively and effectively. Now, what ShotSpotter does ShotSpotter tells you what happened, when it happened, and where it happened. Let me just briefly explain how we do that. Build a sensor network, uh, domer protection in a coverage area, as we've done here in a neighborhood of Kansas City, putting acoustic sensors on rooftops of buildings and on utility poles. Now, the way the system works is that when a gunshot occurs, that event radiates out and the system detects it and locates it. That is to say, we hear the gunfire, we capture it, record that event, and then locate it through triangulation, the time differential for the gunshot to reach each of the sensors. There's a machine classification that previews that event, and then that data is sent to two locations in the country, East Coast and West Coast, where an incident review center agent an acoustic technician reviews the event, goes through a series of steps to make sure that that is in fact gunfire and not a false positive. Heard out immediately to the police so they can respond in real time. The average is about 45 seconds from trigger pull. That goes out to a 911 communication center, a public safety answering point go out to squad cars, desktops as well, but more importantly out to officers in the fields, to their mobile data terminals or tablets. It goes to phones and even to smartwatches. And we perform both on Android and iOS platforms. So regardless of the type of device the officers have. Let me just give you one quick example and then I'll turn it over to Kevin on what this might look like from an officer's perspective. So when there's a gunshot in the coverage area, the officer would get a unique audio alert on their device. As I said, laptops, tablets, phones, watches. They would look at the screen and see what you're seeing now. A satellite view of the situation, the number of rounds fired in that pin dot, 25 meter radius, that's our initial crime scene. Now we train, cop to the dot. That is, go to where the dot is, that's where the shooting occurred, that's where your victim might be, that's where your forensic evidence will be, that's where percipient witness will be located. 911, when you get a call, sends you usually to the front door of a house, and that's not usually where the shooting occurred. But we do correlate the street address for computer aided dispatch purposes, and I'll show you in a second what else we can do with that. We give you the timestamp to the millisecond, so you can coordinate that with other technologies, UAVs, drones, license plate readers, and cameras. We tell you if there's more than one shooter. We tell you if there's a high capacity weapon. If there was a full automatic, we tell you that as well. And then we can give the police an investigative lead summary with a breakdown of every shot fired and the sequence of shots that would help in their initial investigation. Again, all this is available now. Uh, including uh, best practices. I'll just quickly show you one other thing the officers can do. Last 24 hours since our last shift, been off for a couple of days, they just click and go to three. Been off for more than a couple of days, like a week's vacation, click and go as well. 
This is great for command deployment, re uh, resource allocation, but officer familiarization gives them a sense of uh, awareness, situational awareness. So not only in real time to each incident, but an overview of what's been happening on their beat. Now let me pause there now and give Kevin a chance to talk to you about the path forward. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, on the contrary, it's saying that you're getting comprehensive notification from us, but 911 is not fulfilling your need because people are reluctant to call. Um, and we can work on improving that. Uh, let me just take a moment, if I may, in answer to your question, and address why that might be. Why don't people call 911? And this is not unique to Kansas City. This is what I've been experienced for the last six years. Uh, prior to that, in my own experience as a chief, but traveling around the country, this is not a regional phenomenon. When I go to community meetings and speak to residents about their experience, they say, we don't call the police. And I say, why? Most commonly, I hear the following. They don't want to call and cry wolf. They're not always sure that noise is gunfire. They heard a bang, looked outside the window, didn't see anything. Don't want to send a false alarm. They assume someone else is calling closer to the event. Again, looked out the window, didn't see anything, and it sounded like it was some distance away, presuming that someone close by would call relative to the victim, the victim, him or herself, but then nobody calls. They're afraid. They're afraid if they call the police, the police will send a car to their door, and what if the shooter or the shooter, shooter's associates see that? They're worried about retaliation. And then finally, and I find this most troubling, They've given up because they haven't seen a police response before. They don't expect one. They may attribute the non-response to deliberate indifference when in fact it's simply a communication problem because people aren't calling. So they say we just adapt to it. And I can go on, time doesn't permit, about what happens then when there's a desensitization, a normalization of gun violence. Young men self-police joining gangs or groups, people adapt their quality of life, don't use playgrounds, leave, let the kids leave home after school. That diminished quality of life is the most insidious effect of gun violence. It's not just people dying and people getting shot. It's the diminished quality of life that accommodates normalization. And people don't call. So did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Let me say 6.6% of the shots call 911. The rest of them do not. But, but, but our center gets all those uh, notifications. Your center, as well as the officers on the street, are getting shots button notifications uh, to their devices. So the dispatch is able to monitor it. Real-time crime center gets the data, and the officers in the field have the capability of getting it, whether it's on their car, computer, or on their phone, or even on their watch. Those notifications are sent out simultaneously by us. Not somebody calls. Correct. Correct. Yeah. What I'm suggesting in the absence of shot spotted, this is the reality, is you're probably only getting the national average is 20%. In this particular neighborhood where we're deployed, we're seeing even less than that. Thank you for your question. First off, good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Johnson. I'm a customer success director with ShotSpotter for the Kansas City Police Department. Prior to joining ShotSpotter last year in May of 2020, I served 30 years with the Chicago Police Department. I retired as a rank of deputy chief. During my tenure, I was in charge of our training academy, our community policing strategy, and I was also a commander in two districts, one district back in 2017, where we onboarded ShotSpotter in Chicago along with our SDSC rooms, which is basically our real-time crime center. I just want to basically go through a couple of recommendations that we might have. I really want to come in and try and do a health check for what you already have, like Trisha and Ron mentioned earlier. It's not additional coverage. We want to see if we can maximize what you already have going forward, looking at how ShotSpot is being implemented, how we can increase the value and the resources available to the officers using ShotSpotter. Just a quick story, when, when I was in Chicago, we onboarded ShotSpotter. I had a lot of skeptics, to be honest, I had a lot of skeptics of my police officers. 
my, my supervisors, my frontline supervisors. I really stressed to them how important it was for officer safety, situational awareness, and community positive community engagement. I would have my officers go out on the shot spot alerts. When they go out there, they would arrive on the scene. If someone shot, save a life, request medical help get them to an ambulance, get some help. We also had, that time we had Lee Mart system where officers had a bag where they would take and put blood clotting and trauma kits on, person, on victims and send them out. Right. Make an arrest if someone's on the scene. And a, a recover ground truth evidence, basically shell casings. Recover that evidence, send it back up through NIBIN and ATF to do an analysis to find out where that game, gun came from. Finally, if no one was shot, the residents in the community to a shot spot alert, what's going on? And you build that trust and that legitimacy. So it benefited two things. One, my officers were safe knowing they had shot spotted because they had the information right there where exactly they were going. A 911 call may send you 300 feet away because if the officer gets a 911 call, the officer is going to go to the 911 call. The location all came in. With shot spotter, it's giving them the precise location where the shot took place. And that made my officers safer. And at the same time, I engaged the community because I wanted them to understand what was going on, what's happening. Shot spotter does not lend to over policing. I made it clear you're responding to a shot spotter like gunfire in this area where there's gun violence. Shot spotter was responding to where the gun, gun violence is occurring. So that was huge and that was important for us. I spoke earlier about a training refresh. If possible, I'd like to have the opportunity to come in and work with the, the majors, the captains in, the, in that district where the coverage area is at and show them, like Tris said, how much shot spotter has changed over the last nine years. It has changed by leaps and bounds. Look at the new resources that are available. Um, everything, the platforms, everything that's in Shot Spotter that can help reduce gun violence in, our, in the city. We also want to establish a way to, with metrics and key performance indicators so you can know, so the department can look at what they're doing with Shot Spotter and be able to report out the results and metrics and KPIs based on the data for Shot Spotter alerts. Stakeholder engagement. He's our community engagement director, and he comes from a social work background and a law enforcement background. And he specifically works with cities and so it's very important to try and bring him in and work with community organizations, different groups, whoever you would like to work with to really establish that broader community engagement piece. And that's it. I want to add quickly to that on stakeholder engagement, for example, it's being done now that's part of the health check uh, but among uh, some of the practices we look at is is shot spotter data in piece are they being given the data so that they can deploy more effectively and strategically focus deterrence programs recognizing that most of the concentrated by a very very small percentage of your population usually less than one percent focus deterrence programs to identify those groups that are responsible for most of the violence, it can be identified more readily through shot spotter data. I've worked with uh, the New York University ceasefire program, the David Kennedy group. Uh, it's a great program, but they, in, in most cities, they use homicides and non-fatal shootings to determine the concentration of gunfire. Our data can be much more effective. We don't have to wait for a blood shooting to respond. And the last thing I'll just offer in the short time we have is taking shot spotter data sharing it with school officials for trauma-informed care. We recognize, and I'm sure the police department does as well, that your gun violence victims are not just those where a bullet penetrates flesh. It's the people who are vicariously traumatized, and it's particularly important to recognize that our youth are harmed not just psychologically, but indeed physiologically. It's disrupted neurodevelopment when they have vicarious trauma. So what we're suggesting is take the shot spotter data, the yellow dots that I showed you on the screen earlier, share that with your public school officials and your private school officials. See where those clusters are happening. Look at your student roster and see if in fact 
some of your students living in those neighborhoods where there's gunfire have been adversely affected. Maybe then we understand why there's misbehavior in the classroom. Maybe understand why grades are slipping. Absenteeism is higher because that vicarious trauma is affecting their performance in school. And that's just one example of stakeholder engagement. And a host of things that Kevin can talk about, but we're being respectful to the time we've been allotted. And I thank you again for this opportunity. Just one thing I would like to add in closing, that I understand most of my, some of my clients are all over the country with shot spotter. And it's the same thing everywhere in the United States. Don't feel like you're alone in what's going on. It's happening everywhere. Manpower issues, recruitment issues. That's, all, that's throughout the country. The main thing I take with shot spotter is the fact that I need one officer doing the right thing at the right time. Responding to that alert, saving lives, making arrests, engaging the community. That's a huge, that's a, that's a huge thing for us. So, any questions, concerns, I'd be glad to answer. So I, I have a question and, and it, I think it goes back to the beginning. I was reading uh, that initially KCATA started Shot Spotter here. What was the advantage for the bus company to have Shot Spotter? Honestly, I don't know. I wasn't with Shot Spotter back then. I okay. do know that that KC um, PD is the only agency that actually purchased Shot Spotter using transportation monies. It was okay. kind of a smart way to do it, probably, but um, <laughs> nobody's done it since. Um, there's a lot of other funding avenues we see people use, but but that hasn't been one of them that's traditional for us. Okay. Mr. Press, if I may, and I know uh, former Councilman Reed is here too. Um, in so many words, it relates to funding. Um, okay. Federal grant help fund. Uh, this Department of Transportation gotcha. made it available for uh, bus companies, knowing that we have both transit routes and, and other areas that have shooting concerns and others. That's why it originated with KCATN. Got you. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and of course, I was not uh, a fan of Shot Spotter because of what I saw budgetary wise. I think that this explanation uh, helps a little bit more. Uh, to, to know if we utilize the data and the information that it can help with uh, community involvement. And, and that, I think, does it for me in terms of, of the importance of it. Uh, any other questions from board members? I just had a question. You mentioned about the training. You said uh, we've had it nine years. Do we get training every year or do we have to request that? I mean, how efficient are we? And I'm sure there's always room for improvement. The training is available. I mean, we do refreshers throughout the country. So I'm willing to come in with the, the rest of the team. We'll, we'll go to cover every watch. We'll work with the majors and the captains to cover every watch and give that training to the officers with no additional cost. Okay. And do we get updates on, you know, when you guys change something and what's happening and, and you'll come in and train as, as far as that goes as well. Any software update, any service update, we try to communicate with the agency. Uh, preferably we come into town and meet uh, and do it that way. But I also say, having been a chief twice, training is expensive. Even the vendor provides it for free. It costs the police department to put people in the seats. So we can do a lot of this virtually. We can do a lot through recorded videos. There are a number of avenues to make it least painful for the chief financially to accommodate the training. We're willing to work with whatever uh, you want, Thank whatever you. format. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think on the recommendation, it's a recommendation for a one year renewal of shot spotter. Um, is, is, there a, is there a motion? Is it a two year or one year? I'm reading on the on the end of this uh, memorandum from Anthony Rizzo that says recommended approval for one year renewal shot spotter gun uh, detection system uh, and then it gives the cost and then it says year two will be at the same cost so we have the option to do a one year or two year. Is that so that's item. Item, it'll be item number six. Uh, 
that we have. But if you look at in tab B, for those of you who are looking for it, and I'll find it, it's it's a two year, but we only have to pay one year at a time. Gotcha. But do, so we, is, do we have to commit to two years? Yes. It's and, 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 and as the mayor was saying, this is from 2012. That's when we started this. It was grant funds that paid for it originally. And then the board agreed after that five years that they would pay they're going forward. So this contract is is a uh, cost is for one year. Year two will be at the same cost for a total of three hundred seventy nine thousand seven hundred twenty nine dollars. But we'll only have to pay for the first one year at a time, not two. But but we're ma we're making a two year commitment and we're going to pay one year at a time. That's correct. Okay. I move approval. Second. Uh, are we going to? Should we take advantage of their? Uh, offer to train us oh, absolutely. virtually, oh, no. and, that, or do we feel like we're already know everything about it? We we already work with the company, but yes, if they're willing to come in and train, we'd absolutely take any training. Yes, been moving and, second. All uh, and the other question is uh, our experience with shots, but I've heard presentations before is. It's really excellent, is it not? I mean, we, we do know where the shots are and we do respond in a particular area, which is a high crime area. Right. And and it can be moved around a little bit if we need, if we chose to do that. It, it's been stationary. It's been, it's been stationary. It's a fixed area. And, and is that right. still the same, same exact area. right spot for where all the shots are or should it, should it be moved? Um, it, because it was an ATA grant, it was focused on an area where the bus was um, having the most issues, I think, is what they looked at is where they thought the, the, the shot spotter should be placed, if I recall right. So it was the intent was to, to capture that bus line. Is that still where most yeah, of the shots correct. are? I, I don't know if that's where most of the shots are. I can't say that off the top of my head. I, I think we'd have to go back. I mean, that's nine years ago. I'm sure a lot has changed. <laughs> I think we should go back and look and perhaps put them in a different location. If there's a higher crime area, in other words, if there's an area where the crime is higher or where the shot. Where We'd be happy to revisit that. No problem. All right. Um, I think we're in the middle of a motion. You've heard the motion. Uh, all in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. And so that. Um, we, we will dig into the weeds about training and all that uh, down the line. All right. Um, crime report. Morning, commissioners. Morning. My information is under tab D in your books. The first, you, know, you should have a hard copy of the daily homicide analysis, the blue sheet. You refer to that document, you observe that to date, there have been 127 homicides in 2021. That's compared to 156 uh, in 2020 year to date. This is an 18.6% decrease. Additionally, the five year average of homicides year to date is 124. So we're currently up 2.4% compared to the five year average. We've cleared 81 homicides in the current year. This number includes homicides that occurred in 2021 and homicides that occurred in previous years. You should also have a paper copy of the non-fatal shooting comparison report. You will note that from January 1 to October 25, 2021, there were 434 non-fatal shooting victims in Kansas City. In 2020, we had 540 non-fatal shooting victims during the same time period. So we're down 19% compared to last year. In September 2021, we had 29 non-fatal shooting victims compared to 53 in September of the previous year. On the third page, you'll find the September 2021 non-fatal shooting report. It shows that of the 29 non-fatal shooting victims in September, 19 were cooperative. In other words, 10 victims or 4% were initially uncooperative and did not wish to press charges against whoever shot them. 
Black males accounted for the highest number of non-fatal shooting victims with 20, which is 69% of the total number of victims. There were also four black female and four white male victims, along with one Hispanic male victim during the reported period. The age group with the highest number of non-fatal shooting victims was 25% of the total. 35 to 44 in the 45 and over age groups were tied for second with six victims each. There were also three victims between the ages of 18 and 24 and two victims of 17 and under. There were 32 reported suspects involved in these shootings. At the time of this report, 17, three suspects were described as white males, which is 9% of the total. There was also one black female and one white female suspect. Six were between the ages of 18 and 24, or 35%. And three were between, excuse me, between the ages of 25 and 34. And one was in the 45 and over age group. Moving on to the sixth page, you'll see the recovered firearms report. The department recovered 215 firearms in September 2021 compared to 220 in September of 2020. The five-year average for firearms recovered in the month of September is 202. And from January 1 through September 30th of 2021, we have recovered 1,827 firearms. There's no questions regarding firearms-related offenses Captain Tim Hernandez, commander of the Special Victims Unit, will provide a brief report on the lethal, excuse me, lethality assessment program. It's a tool used to help reduce the number of domestic violence related homicides. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Tim Hernandez. I'm the commander of the Special Victims Unit. My team consists of the Juvenile Unit, the Sex Crimes Unit, and the Domestic Violence Unit. Give you first. I want to kind of give you a little history before how we would handle domestic violence calls. Officers would make calls when it was a domestic violence call in nature. They conduct their investigation. They would make an arrest when needed. Complete a report. Issue subpoenas to witnesses, victim, give them the court date. And then we provide them a piece of paper with phone numbers on how to get an ex parte, hours operation of the county courthouses and some information on numbers on how to get shelter. Didn't have much on top of that really we could use to help assist the victims of domestic violence. And then in 2009, LAP came along. LAP originated in Maryland and it was the result of a uh, uh, John Hopkins University study. What they were doing, they were examining homicide victims of domestic violence. And what they wanted to do to see if there was any indicators or anything that we could see in domestic violence that would show the victims that were at high risk of becoming subject to a homicide in regards to domestic violence. The lethality assessment, what they wanted to find was these indicators, these red flags. And what their studies found is there's 11 critical questions that officers can ask in the field of victims to determine if those individuals are indeed at a high risk of going down that path and possibly become a, a victim of homicide. The 11 questions that were meant to identify the victims of domestic violence who are at the greatest risk of being killed, purpose of getting them out of the harm's way if necessary, and encouraging them to go to a domestic violence shelter. This was in 2009, and we were the first major police department to adopt this program. I remember Major Mark Olson's out there, and he was at the time the coordinator, and he did a lot with helping us implement the program. So I want to kind of explain how it works and how do we do this and what the officers in the field and the detectives in the unit do. When we go on a domestic violence call, we take these 11 questions that were developed through John Hopkins, and it's on a report. It's a lethality assessment protocol program report we have in LAP. It's a series of questions that the officers ask the victims. They ask the subjects if, they, uh, if the uh, suspect ever used a weapon against or threatened you with a weapon. Has the subject threatened to kill you or your children? Do you think the subject might try to kill you? 
Does the subject have a gun or can the subject get one easily? Has the subject ever tried to choke you? Is the subject separated after living together or being married? Is the subject unemployed? Has the subject ever tried to kill himself or herself? Do you have a child that the subject knows is not? Does the subject follow or spy on you or leave threatening messages? Now, how the victim responds to this is what triggers our protocol. There's certain responses they give, numbers as far as, for instance, the first three, if they respond yes to it, it triggers our protocol. Or if they uh, respond no to those three, but three to the following eight, it triggers it. And what that does, it, it triggers our protocol where we partner with several advocacy throughout the, the city, um, primarily Rosebrook and Synergy up north. And those are our partners that we really rely on. What we do is if we have a victim that has initiated and triggered these indicators, we'll contact one of the advocates at these centers via phone there at the scene. And we'll do everything that we can to try to set up those victims with these advocates so we can get them additional services than what we were able to provide before. And those services range from anything, getting them into a safe place. There's two phases to it. There's, there's phase one, that initial um, safe plan that we put in place immediately at that time on the phone is making sure that that victim has a safe place to go. What we want to do is get them somewhere safe. Um, and also we'll assist them with getting an emergency ex parte. Brooks helps us out with getting those assistance. All of these LAP forms that we complete are included with the case file, included with the report itself, so the detectives have this additional information, as well as the courts and probation and parole. Um, Rosebrook and Synergy, of course, they'll do follow-up as well. After that initial contact with the individual, they try to um, follow up within 24, 48 hours. And that follow-up, what they'll try to do is to provide additional resources as far as counseling, um, services to them that may help them to uh, find new housing, uh, even with medical care. And they act sort of as a court advocate as well. They help them through the process. They work with us and we partner and we work through getting the victim everything they need for court and letting them know where we're at with the process and they'll walk them all the way through. Like all programs that we do on the department, we're always evaluating and looking at and assessing. And we talk about change a lot, and we do that all the time. Every program, what we do is we want to examine our practices, policies, procedures, and make sure that we're doing the best we can to provide the best services to the community. With LAP, we recently did that. With uh, Rosebrook taking the initiative, we set up a blueprint committee, committee where we examined KCPD specifically how we handle domestic violence calls, and to see if there's anything that we can do better or we can improve on. Um, our findings, we found that we do a really good job as far as the contact, the immediate contact we make with the victims and the services we provide. But we found that there was some more that we could add to the LAP, some additional questions that we could add that could help not only on our investigative side, but also through the, the court process as well for probation, parole, and for the court. Um, on this committee, it was members of KCPD, we had Rose Brooks, we had Jackson County Prosecutor's Office and Municipal Court and Probation for a long time. Again, like I said, our, our key partners are Rose Brooks Center and Synergy Services. And the findings that we found with the, uh, the, uh, with the blueprint committee we had is, we wanted to add some additional questions which we implemented into policy, change of policy we just adopted, and additional training to officers. And we added these three additional critical questions. Do you think the subject will seriously injure or kill you or your children? If yes, what makes you think so? If no, what makes you think not? Two, how frequently or seriously does a subject intimidate, threaten, or assault you? And three, has the suspect threatened to harm you if you call the police or participate in the court legal process? We're able to take these responses and uh, uh, for trial to have that uh, foundation to show the extent and the seriousness of the, the offenders, but uh, judges are also able to use it when setting bond and, of course, probation parole use it as well when they're um, determined on what route they need to do if the subjects or the suspect is on probation or parole. <laughs> Any 
in closing, I just want to uh, uh, thank the officers of the field, our detectives and domestic violence unit, and of course our advocacy groups. We couldn't do it without them. And without all these members, these men and women taking that extra time and those steps to ask these additional questions, um, the program wouldn't work. But um, we've seen great success with it. And it helps us get those victims that we identify in a high risk and we're able to put them into uh, contact with an advocate that can get them services to help them break that cycle. Um, so out of those 14 questions, how many have to be there's, answered there's, affirmatively before it, the next level is triggered? Well, there's 11 questions. Okay. And we ask them on all domestic violent calls. We, we, we ask the victim these questions after we complete our paperwork, we do our investigation. The first three questions, if they answer yes to any of them, it triggers the protocol where we contact an advocate. If they answer no to those, if they answer yes to three of the following eight, it triggers it. Now, of course, this is just uh, this. This is relying on if the victim wants to answer these questions and if they want to work with us. When we first rolled it out in 2009, we had about a 20 percent success rate where the victims would actually speak with an advocate, either through the phone or through the officer. Or there's also a box on the bottom of the. Uh, is it okay if an advocate contacts you too late? Because sometimes they're not in a place or they don't really want to speak to anyone right now, but they'll check the box, yes, and an advocate will contact them at a later time. Um, we've improved dramatically. Now, I mean, we've always shot for at least getting a 50% participant rate for those individuals that are in the high risk of uh, a serious threat to homicide. And we are now, today, this year, we're at a 57%. 57% of those victims do take that next step and do want to reach out to advocates to get that services. And I know since the inception, KCPD, we've completed over 30,000 LAP reports. Uh, and out of that 20,000, those individuals were deemed in the high risk category of um, indicators of being um, victims to homicide. But, but, but again, this is something we couldn't do without all of our partners and without the uh, officers and detectives in the field taking that extra step and going that extra mile and completing the form. Um, the officers in the field wear many hats. It's not just enforcement. That's just a small part of the job that they do day in, day out. There's other hats they wear as far as problem solving and coming up with solutions. And this is one of the tools that we have that our officers and detectives can use to help get those victims out of that vicious cycle and try to get them to the people that can help them with uh, additional resources. Any other question? I just want to say thank you. I think what you're doing is a great program uh, and much needed. And um, I'm glad to hear that, you know, it's, it's being successful for you guys. Thank you. Deputy Chief? Deputy Chief Maven, does that conclude your report or is there more? Uh, Deputy Chief True has uh, some information, and then I'll go back and, and conclude after that. Good morning, Commissioners and Mayor. Morning. I have Sergeant Mike Wolge here and Sergeant uh, John Pickens, and they're going to talk about a major property crime case that they worked on that had a great outcome. It's a case they're actually kind of still working on. So, and it made the news. So you want to show the news clip and then just talk about the case a little bit. And Sergeant or Captain Jason Asper is also with them. Good morning, board. Good morning. Thank you for your time. Uh, just, uh, I'm Jason Asper. I'm assigned to the Metro Patrol Division. I'm a captain. With me today is Mike Volge, who is the Metro Property Crimes Sergeant, and John Pickens, who is the Metro Impact Sergeant. And what we'd like to do is talk to you about uh, a great teamwork between uh, patrol and investigations that led to a, an outstanding community outcome, including the recovery of a lot of stolen property that was meant for a charitable organization within our mm -hmm. city. And what was really neat is commanders, these groups worked together, including taking you through how the officer on the street developed reasonable suspicion. So I'll let them take it from here. Thank you. Good 
Good morning. I uh, just wanted to highlight some of the people that were involved in all this. Um, like the captain said, uh, this is Sergeant John Pickens and the people that he uh, that work, he works for Metro Impact. Uh, the people that work for him that were involved were uh, the uh, Officer Jeff Peacock, Officer Eddie Morales, Officer Ronnie Davis, Officer Jacob Alexander, Officer Wesley Wasmer, and Officer Chris Sheets. Um, and a few of the people that were involved in this were, for me were that work for me are uh, Detective Daniel Kincaid, Detective Derek Galloway, uh, Detective Robert Martin. On uh, so the way this kicked off is basically my officers in the impact squad uh, were doing routine re patrol. They recognize uh, criminal activity at different houses in the area because they're familiar with their with their bad guys. They saw some stolen property up at a house they believed was stolen. It was a couple CDs parked at a at a residence they known to be a drug house. Uh, they didn't recognize them to be their prior, so they snapped some photos of them. Started conducting surveillance on the on the house and they sent those photos over to Mike Volge's team and the property crimes unit who took those pictures and shared them out through uh, some investigative internet forums with other detectives. And within, uh, at that time we were conducting surveillance. Uh, the house was very busy, uh, lots of people in and out. It was a, a very high traffic drug house. Uh, we made some quick stops uh, of people leaving that location. Uh, and in those first five stops, we recovered um, I don't know, 60 plus grams of methamphetamine, 14 grams of heroin, uh, some marijuana, and cleared many, many city warrants. As a matter of fact, the, the house was so busy, I had to call other impact squads from other zones to come and assist us uh, in making these stops because people were coming and going so quickly. Uh, during that time, Sergeant Volge and his team of detectives were working to gain a search warrant from the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office. And we had to be, during that time also, we had to conduct interviews of those suspects we were stopping to ensure we were getting enough probable cause to gain a search warrant and have it executed. So at that point, um, once the search warrant was obtained, uh, Sergeant Volge's guys took over and I'll let him go on from there. Uh, just so you know, we the this the search warrant we kind of uh, this all started early on in the day, and by the time we had all the information available, it was almost five o'clock at night. So we had most of the detectives and officers had come in at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, so about five o'clock, we submitted the uh, search warrant based on the stolen jet skis and the uh, as well as the uh, stops that we had made on all the different uh, arrests that were uh, came out from that had left the house. Uh, approximately 2030, our team, one of our tactical response team, executed the search warrant at the house. Um, just for those maybe who have forgotten and who uh, or don't know, uh, this is kind of what we encountered when we came into the house. Uh, this was a garage that was behind the house. Uh, um, and I'll go through some of the stuff that we recovered uh, as a result of the warrant. As a result, we recovered over five hundred thousand oh dollars in stolen property, um, uh, stolen concert equipment. And I'll show a, a news clipping here in a minute. Um, we had uh, all this uh, concert style equipment that was in the house. Uh, just one piece alone. Um, it was an audio soundboard. Uh, the victim valued at $201,879 uh, that was in this house that, you know, started off as just us finding some stolen jet skis and it kind of snowballed into a lot more. We had a, a zero turn lawnmower that uh, we um, we recovered. Um, kind of this is what we had to do in order to get the uh, to get the thing back to the station. We had to have one of our, <laughs> one of our officers uh, uh, driving it. Uh, back to the station luckily we were close so we didn't have to we didn't have to go super far but uh and no he hasn't been drinking I, he, doesn't know how to, <laughs> he doesn't know how to work the zero turns so uh, we found numerous diving masks uh and fins uh 28 total diving masks uh they were their high the high-end snorkeling type sets uh six sets of fins and then 22 prescription mask lenses were all brand new in the box. Uh, looked like it was sold, sold from uh, stolen from some type of real uh, retail 
outlet, but we haven't been able to locate them yet. Uh, professional style tennis rackets we found in there. Uh, the victim lived in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, so we're still trying to track her down as well. Uh, we found the gas powered uh, uh, plate compactor. It's for concrete, a thousand dollar value. That was a victim here in Kansas City. He was really excited. A small business guy was able to get uh, this tool back. Um, we also found a bunch of electronic locks stolen from uh, North Kansas City in a burglary. Seven total digital locks valued at $200 each. Another small business owner. Uh, we also, in addition, we found uh, stolen um, uh, tool power tools from retailers across the metro area. Still in the box, still ready to or ready to you know be sold at a store. Uh, we found a vintage motorcycle in the garage there. Uh, we don't know the value, but it looks like it, it would be a fairly expensive. Uh, this was stolen out of Overland Park, Kansas. This is the new story I spoke about earlier. This is the gentleman. I'll just, just kind of set it up. This is the gentleman that uh, it was all his concert equipment. And to say that he was uh, extremely happy that he got his stuff back is an understatement. Uh, he was pretty pretty stoked when he came in and met with all the detectives and, uh, and all the officers. Got somebody from IT. A pretty good caveat to if, if that doesn't play is that all this concert equipment was being donated to one of Travis Kelsey's uh, buildings that he's putting in the inner city down on Truce, mm -hmm. and that was to help people with music and, and help uh, underprivileged people have a place to come and learn how to use this type of equipment. Uh, so he was super happy to get it back so that he could donate it back to them. A local man can breathe a sigh of relief today. Police were able to hunt down and return about $200,000 worth of stolen equipment. As KCTV 5's Greg Payne explains, his property was part of an even bigger theft ring around the metro and beyond. It was at this storage facility on East 47th Street in Kansas City where Warpus Powell's equipment was stolen. The mm. discovery that left him speechless. I'm a martial art master. And to make a mask to cry, it must be something really effective. Three weeks ago, more than $200,000 worth of musical equipment had disappeared. That equipment, Powell says, was intended for local organizations like the Breakthrough Project and Travis Kelsey STEM Project that helped keep kids out of trouble through music. And Powell wasn't the only victim. Earlier this week, police served a search warrant, finding stolen items from Kansas City, Blue Springs, Overland Park, and even as far out as Louisville, Kentucky. Items like scuba gear, vintage motorcycles, concrete mixer equipment, all in addition to Powell's music equipment. The detectives they did such a great job and such a fast job in locating some of the equipment. So at least the students and the kids will still have music, something that they could play on, something to do after school. He's still missing some speakers, guitars, vinyls, and other musical items. Will he say what they were able to help recover was largely thanks to what Powell did before the incident. When you have items, you want to make sure if you take a photo, you can etch your initials in that property, um, take pictures and write the serial numbers down. That is what really, really helps us be able to track items. Police are still working to connect those other stolen items to their owners, but say a local trucking organization is volunteering to help transport Powell's heavy equipment back to him. Reporting in Kansas City, I'm Greg Payne for KCTV 5 News. Um, also, uh, we got we, we reached out to a local uh, moving company. Uh, Mr. Powell was, like I said, was beyond excited. However, he was that it was all bigger equipment. One piece, uh, I personally know, weighed about nine hundred pounds because I had to lift it uh, to get it into the back of the truck when we recovered it. So we worked with a local moving company to get it moved for him. Um, and these are just some photographs that we took of the officers. You know, and these are all the people that work for us that were doing all this. Uh, uh, that helped Mr. Powell out. Uh, 
they help load it all up and take it to a, a more secured location. Um, so kind of in conclusion, uh, you know, we worked with our media unit as well as uh, our uh, MPD community interaction officer, Brian Masterson. Uh, we put out all this information and it kind of spiraled into because uh, we we had all this stuff and we didn't know who it belonged to, all the stolen property. Um, and we didn't know who it belonged to. So we had them post everything to us meeting Mr. Powell and getting back uh, about five hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, their property. I mean, really, the reason this works so well is our people are out there working for us. It's not, not it wasn't me and Mike out there doing the grunt work and the hard work. We were just helping direct it. And so our praise really needs to go to our officers and then our detectives and then being able to reach out and work with other agencies and other units on the police department to make this happen was, was really good for us. And that's part of what we want to promote with with doing this and being invited down here to share this with you guys is that we have to work as a team and that in working as a team not only with our impact squad our metro property crimes but other divisions the media unit other agencies around the metropolitan area we were able to return a ton of stolen property uh start some ongoing investigations in regard to some other things with this and get a ton of victims back all their property so that's, that's really all we have to share with you in regard to this today. What is an impact squad? So an impact is a proactive squad within patrol. Each uh, division has them. There are six officers and a sergeant assigned. Uh, and what we do is we're targeting criminal activity within our zone. But bad guys don't really know zones. So sometimes patrol guys are stuck in their zone. Mm -hmm. Impact guys will go wherever the leads are chasing them. Um, and we're targeting armed robbers, aggravated assault suspects, uh, shooters, homicide suspects. And then on top of finding those guys, we're working with property crimes and people in our division with solving problems in our area. Uh, so this was a known drug house in our area that is obviously a large fencing operation for stolen property. And our guys are out there every day making contacts with the community and using sources of information. And uh, we target whatever crime falls in front of us, we work. Have charges been filed? Uh, there's charges pending in regard to the stolen property. Yeah, charges are still pending on the property. We're still trying to track down a, a, a lot of victims. I mean, this thing spanned several different cities in the metropolitan area as well as out, out of state. Uh, so, so we're still trying to track all that stuff down. And once we get it all put together, uh, we will be submitting state charges. That is awesome. Uh, remind me, this was detected originally by a patrol officer? It was by an impact officer. Okay. So assigned, right. One of my guys assigned to me. Uh, just noticed the sea dews parked up in this driveway. Yeah. Knew they didn't belong there because he hadn't right. seen them there prior. And, and he just snapped a picture of them. Contacted the detectives and said, hey, are these shows stolen? Because the, the license plates were backed up to the back of the house. So we weren't able to identify them that way. Obviously, walking up to the house would have blown our cover. We work mm -hmm. in both covert and overt uh, operations down there. And so he was working covertly. And uh, <clears throat> through the pictures that he took with his cell phone, he was able to get them identified through the detective down property crimes. My, my uh, detective, uh, <clears throat> once she got the picture, she reached out to the victim, who happened to be a resident in uh, Shoal Creek Patrol Area, Kansas City resident. Uh, it showed him the picture, and he's like, without a doubt, he said that those were his jet skis, even described some, certain aspects of what was on the trailer, and that's how we were able to move forward and uh, up, obtain the search warrant. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. Great work. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioners, last month, you may recall that Sergeant Janita Harris of the Gang Intelligence Squad presented information on our Risk for Retaliation program. I'd yes. like to report that during the month of September, the Gang Intelligence Squad conducted 13 Risk for Retaliation messages, messaging, excuse me, and also eight additional ones were referred to other units. And these uh, covered subjects involved in homicides, aggravated assaults, and other feuds. So we intervened in 21 situations that were likely um, to have a, a violent outcome. 
I'll now also report on case submissions. During the month of September, KCPD submitted a total of 385 cases to county prosecutor's offices. Charges were filed in 181 cases during the month. 49 of the cases were charged in custody and 132 warrants were issued. 29 cases were returned for additional work. 130 cases were declined during the month and 70 of those cases were narcotics related. 69 of those 70 were from Jackson County. Say that again, just the last set of numbers, I'm, I'm gonna retain it. I see it, but I'm not following. So uh, 130 cases were declined during the mm -hmm. month. 70 of those cases were narcotics related, so declined, and 69 of those 70 were from Jackson County. Thank you. Um, it should be noted though that those numbers include cases that were submitted during previous months, but returned during the month of September. There was a 4% decrease in the total number of cases presented to county prosecutor's offices during the month of September, 2021, compared to September, 2020. And there was an 18% decrease in the total number of cases charged by county prosecutor's offices compared to September, 2020. And that concludes my report, unless you have any questions. Any questions? Great report. And uh, all right, we have a community outreach uh, report from social service programs. I'll start out. Um, each month, I give you numbers of the kids that we interact with with PAL, and I thought it would be important to do a more in depth presentation because as we struggle to fill the police cars, you know, there's people in the community and, and even on the department that that start to question, you know, can we afford to continue staffing this un these these types of units? Um, this presentation, I hope will show you that it's it's invaluable and we have to, it's it's imperative that we keep filling these units with officers, even as we struggle to to fill the cars. So Skip Cox is a sergeant in the Powell unit. He's been there 10 years. Um, it's not just a job to skip. He does this. I happen to be friends away from work with Skip. This is a very big part of his life. It's not Monday through Friday for him. And uh, I thought it'd be he would be one of the best to, to make this presentation for you. Good morning. Thank you, Colonel. Um, appreciate the time to be here this morning. And it's kind of cool because I get to share a very positive spotlight in our program, um, in our department, our community. So I hope that um, by the time we're done, I can kind of educate um, to whatever understanding you understand about PAL, but also to maybe provide a, a sense of, um, maybe inspire some pride in what we do and what we do for our kids in our community, because it's it's pretty special. Um, and I'll take any questions, so if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt or wait till the end. But, um, this is our mission statement, and quite honestly, um, there's there's some words up there, but really the meaning behind it is that we take community volunteers, um, community partners, businesses, put them together with police officers, and we actually um, work to help inner city kids, at-risk youth who have some challenges, um, and just provide a better um, path for them to, to consider. And what that says up there too is that it's really about relationships. It's about building positive relationships with our kids. Um, some of the things that we've talked about you've already heard this morning, I hope to kind of answer um, from like a budget standpoint, and as the Colonel mentioned, um, from a staffing standpoint and how that impacts us as well. But just a little bit of history on the PAL programs. It, you may not know this, but there's 200, about 275 PAL chapters in North America. Um, so PAL started in the early 1900s. It started for us here in, in Kansas City in 1998. And we started with a satellite program, so we didn't actually have a facility. Our officers would go to different schools and they would interact with the kids during recesses or during uh, lunch or some type of gym activity, but they started to build those relationships. And then in 2000, we took the, uh, the Blue Valley Community Center, if you know that in the old Northeast area. Um, so that was, Parks and Rec had that building for a long time and they were actually gonna walk away from it because couldn't get programming there, couldn't get kids there. And so they offered it to us. So our PAL board entered into a long-term um, 
agreement where we took over that facility. And quite honestly, it was, I think, a dollar a year is what we paid for that long term. And in the first several years, we probably overspent because the building was pretty bad. Um, so, and, I, and there's a, I mean, there's an incredible statistic up there is that from 2000, so we took the building over in 2000 and from 2000, 2012, this condemned building, um, we had cops who were trying to do their best to make that building work for our program. And to say that uh, maybe we have a lot of different, uh, we wear a lot of different hats, but we're probably not contractors. And we probably don't know exactly what we're doing. So um, in 2012, we created a kind of energized our board and really kind of revamped our board to the point that from 2012 to current date, we've raised about $4 million in renovations and improvements to the facility, while also during that same time raised about $2 million in fundraising dollars just um, dollar amount, especially when I'll show you some, you know, everybody likes those uh, love it and list it uh, program shows on TV where you get to see the before and afters. So I got some before and after pictures too. I'm going to interrupt a second. Sure. You haven't explained your board, but it's a private, not for profit board that runs it, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's the next step. It's kind of the structure right. of how it is. Yeah, that, that's fine. That's a great question because I was kind of talking about that, but it's important to understand that there is a distinction there. Um, so the, the police department provides the staffing. Um, we provide the officers and the sergeants and the captains for the programming, but then that's where the, the funding really stops and this funding picks up with the non-for-profit. Um, we're governed by our board of directors. There's 17 um, volunteers who, um, quite honestly, they're amazing what they do. We, uh, we hand-selected our, our board members and provide that you've got to do time, talent, or treasure and provide one of those things. It is a working board, and as witnessed by those, those numbers, it's pretty evident. Um, but their role is really to do the fundraising for us. And they also do an, an advisory because a lot of our board members are um, professionals in the community, have their own businesses, presidents of companies. Um, I'm just a cop. I don't necessarily know how to do those things, but that's really my role. So I rely on them to help me kind of manage those things. And that's what my role is, is to kind of be a liaison between the department and our board of directors. So I hope that kind of answers that question. But yeah, it is two totally separate things. And the gentleman, the councilman that was talking earlier today about how the funding goes into that. Well, it doesn't show up in a line item on the police department's budget because it is a not-for-profit where it is raised. That money is solely um, the PAL board of directors. So two separate things, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, right now we are staffed by, um, as I said before, we used to be eight officers. Now we're down to one captain, two sergeants, and two officers full-time. And I'll talk about how that kind of impacts what we do on a daily basis. But those numbers up there, that last stat is that we have 1,100 daily contacts with youth on a daily or on a monthly basis. Um, that's pretty impressive. And I get to go to the national conference and all these other PAL chapters. That's a pretty staggering figure that we have that much contact with kids on a daily basis. Um, some of the things that we, some of the organizations that we like to partner with and, and collaborate with, because we realize that it's not just our show and that Quite honestly, any of these organizations are doing the same thing. But PAL is a little bit unique in the fact that we provide a, um, a similar mission, but we provide it with police officers. And when the police officers are there, they get to build the relationships with the kids that then go home and become the allies for us in their own homes. And then we build those relationships with the families and the community and so, as well. So that's where it's a little bit unique um, in the standpoint that we have police officers helping build these relationships. So these are the uh, before and afters, and I'll just kind of throw them through this, because while this is a structure, and if you've ever been there, if you've ever seen it, um, it is just a structure, but it's really the epicenter of everything that happens with PAL. And the cool thing is that all those renovations have been done through donations, through grants, through somebody caring about it, and it really shows how it is a collaborative effort in our community. So in 2012, this is what the facility looked like. Probably not the um, most attractive facility, but it was still a safe place for our kids to come and have an interaction with the, with the officers. Uh, you guys, I think, would recognize, but sometimes when I do this presentation, I have to tell the younger crowd that those are computers. <laughs> computers. <laughs> um, this is our, um, it's, a, it's a huge facility and it has two separate locker rooms which we didn't really utilize. And, and I'll talk more about that as why that was significant. Um, those are like our old showers field. 
And this is what it looks like today. It's an incredible facility, but it's, like I said, it's much more than that. And it really is a community-driven um, organization. So you see that we've got a track that goes around. We've got football, we've got soccer, um, that's baseball and softball. Um, to the point that it's professionally put in. So we have, it's you know professionally leveled, it is um, irrigated, so it is a, it's a beautiful site. And this is one of my favorite pictures because it, it also shows that we have a, a lights and it sits down in a valley and it's an incredible site um, when we have our football or softball games down there. And this is an example too of the, the lights. So I, I, I got uh, the first bid that I got to put these lights in just for our football field was $140,000. And I'm like, well, we've got 5,000. How do we meet in the middle? <laughs> um, so we got the poles donated from um, kcp &L, the lights donated from Johnson County, Johnson County Parks and Rec. And all of the electrical work was done by Mark One, where the bill came down to $20,000. And we had a board member, uh, Mike Carter with Carter Broadcasting, write the check for it. So I told the kids after our first night football game, I wanted to take a picture. And what's significant about this, and we talked about this earlier, is that um, that scoreboard is a donated $18,000 scoreboard. I stood out there one day trying to figure out where I could hide this thing so that it wouldn't get shot up or wouldn't get graffitied. And so in the 10 years that we've done all these improvements, not one thing has happened. And I think it's because the community really does recognize that is, you know, this is, this is the epicenter of, of the change. So that's our new gym floor. Uh, the Hall Family Foundation provided that. Pickleball courts, um, one of the fastest growing uh, sports. We have pickleball courts now at Powell, which is a, an incredible story in and of itself. So these are our locker rooms now, um, a little bit more inviting. But the reason we put those in is because I constantly get calls from um, different schools who say, hey, I've got some of your Powell kids in our program and they haven't had the opportunity. They don't have the best hygiene. And that may be because they don't have running water at home or they don't have you know, electricity for hot water. And it just hit me. So we renovated these two um, locker rooms at a tune of about $125,000 so that the kids have a safe place that they can come in if they need to shower. And we provide clothing for them as well. So that's our, our new computer lab. Um, it's also, so my experience been with, with the kids is that a lot of times is that um, they don't see a value in, in in thinking past beyond tomorrow. And what we try and do is we try and cast a vision for them that and not only are you gonna get through middle school, you're gonna get through high school and then we're gonna help you get on beyond someplace else. And we're gonna be there every step of the way. So one of our board members is a retired uh, basketball coach at Rockhurst University. And he sits down with all of our high school kids and their families and walks them through, if they're interested in going to a community college, helps them with FAFSA um, or a university or a vocational school, or whatever that is, if it's just a job, whatever that is, he's going to help them in that path. And then we also, we're with you every step of the way where we provide scholarships for our kids. What about the police academy? Police academy too, yeah. And I'm going to talk about that as well. I'll show some pictures on, on that too, because it is a great uh, opportunity for us to kind of expand the kids' horizons in a lot of different uh, fields, but law enforcement in particular. So these are some of the programs that we have. Um, boxing and martial arts are probably our two most popular and that's great because uh, the kids, you know, a lot of our kids come from a uh, challenged home environment or uh, whatever the case may be. And this is a great way for them to express themselves, kind of uh, release that emotional tension that they have through these activities. But then on the heels of that, we're able to teach life skills to them as well. Um, so they're learning um, as they're going through this. Is so most pals are geared towards guys in sports. Um, we have almost 50% boys to girls. So we have a lot of programs that are um, either co-ed or specifically for one of the two sexes and, and our girls teams are phenomenal. Football, um, anything that you can think of, quite honestly, we try and provide an opportunity for them. So some of our kids have never ridden a bike before because there's not safe places to do that. So we wrote a grant and got uh, some mountain bikes so we can take kids on and go camping, go caving if you've ever done that. Kids, things that, my own kids haven't been able to do. These kids get the opportunity to go see. And this is a program that we put in, and it's um, this is powerful. So a, a couple of years ago, look, cops are great at um, finding resources for people. Um, so you have a problem, we want to connect the dots and get you a resource. That's what our officers do on a daily basis, interacting with our kids. 
this resiliency program um, two years ago, we started because we brought in child life specialists. And if you don't know what a child life specialist is, because I didn't know, they work in um, children's hospitals, major um, children's hospital, hospitals all across the country. And so when a child comes in, either from an emergency or maybe it's a long-term uh, terminal cancer, something along those lines, they sit down and they work with these kids. They build a trust with them and then they help them go through that process. And our child life specialists now, we have on staff on a daily basis who interact with the kids. And as it says up there, they provide over 1,500 interventions with our kids on a quarterly basis. And interventions mean that our kids come from crisis um, situations. And whether that is a daily thing or it's a long-term issue, they help our kids go through that process and they provide the regulation of coping and, and um, resiliency skills. So it, it's an incredible program. And, and quite honestly, it's now going to start going into other parts of the uh, North America, which I'll talk about too. And as you can imagine, during the pandemic, um, you know, all of us have experienced more stress and it's same for our kids. And so this has been invaluable for them as well. So they do that through some yoga, some every one of every one of our programs has a piece of this in that program, the resiliency. Another big piece, and um, it's fascinating because our, our, a lot of our kids may not get a, a, a meal at night. And so they would come to school and they would go to school and then they would come to our program afterwards. And we realized that, hey, that they're starving. So we created a program where we feed the kids um, 200 to 300 meals uh, on a weekly basis. And then even during the pandemic, we provided with uh, Liberty Fruits, the boxed meals for the families, over 1,500 of those in about three or four month period. So it's an incredible facility with a lot of different things going on. And what we really want to do is be able to expand that um, to the Southland. And it is focused really mainly in that area, but there's always been a concept of, hey, how do we make this happen to other parts of our community? and just without really increasing our staffing. So what we've done is that Major Ivy has spent several times, he's the commander at South Patrol, and he spent several stints at uh, PAL in one capacity or another. And so he really wanted to take this program on. So now what we're doing is we're offering weekend sports clinics and arts and crafts workshops um, for kids in the Southland. And we're hosting Friday night um, events at the PAL Center that are including our resiliency, our uh, child life specialists and our resiliency program, but also uh, adult workshops for the parents, which is phenomenal. Like a lot of times we don't get to get that deep of a, that, um, that deep of a, a contact with the, the parents. And so, you know, we're doing these things for their kids and now they, they bought in and they want to be a part of it. Um, and now we're increasing uh, just our daily contacts in the Southland to about two to 300 on a, on a monthly basis. We had our first uh, basketball clinic um, a couple weeks ago, first week in October, and this is a picture from that. And we do this through a lot of different uh, board-sponsored events. Um, our holiday party, which I have some pictures of our back-to-school event. One of those, those are all incredible events, but one specific to our most recent history is the, uh, the COVID vaccine shots. So um, we partnered with Swope Health, and the nurses would come in and they would do that. We, we've offered four of those vaccine um, opportunities for our community. And they were amazed at how we were able to get um, our Hispanic community to be a part of it. Um, they were talking about how that has always been a challenge of reaching that community for these vaccinations. And because of the trust that we have with our community, they are able to come to Powell and they believe that that's the right thing. And so they, they do that. And so we have 65% of our kids are Hispanic at Powell and probably another 30 are African-American. So we're reaching a demographic that sometimes is missed in that. And they, they believe in PAL and believe in the trust there. So they feel comfortable in coming. Um, so it's a picture of uh, some of the, the past Christmas parties. Um, partners who actually buy gifts for parents. And then the kids get to come down and actually select a gift for their parents or their guardians, whomever they stay with. And it's, I mean, like that is a um, touching moment because those kids don't have that opportunity to do that. That is uh, prior to COVID, our, um, in, the, in the spring, we do a garage sale, if you will, where we offer um, our PAL families and members of the community to come in and, and get clothes for free. 
This year we adapted and had it outside under a great big tent. This year we gave away 8,000 pounds of clothing and 12 pallets of hygiene products. Um, pretty impressive, that's giving the basics who's provided those things. That's our back to school event where we'll serve about 300 kids, provide them all their, their items that they need for schools, haircuts, uh, sports physicals. Academy Sports is a great sponsor for us, 150 bikes that they gave away. Um, other partners, obviously Dayton Moore, the Royals. Um, we've had up to, I think, between 10 to 15 of our, either our PAL kids, that's Carmen, one of our current PAL kids, uh, be part of the Buck O'Neill legacy seat or officers or board members who have been part of this and recognized at the Royals and then the Chiefs. So this is the area that I was talking about when we do have a field day or we bring in different parts of our department so that they can see, the kids can see, it's not just a, a guy or a girl rolling out on the street, is that there's all different types of um, positions on our department. So that's gonna be one of our future uh, SWAT guys. <laughs> And again, just trying to expand the horizons of what, what the kids think about is their daily lives and show them that you do have an opportunity to get there and we're gonna help you get there. Major uh, fundraisers, those are the four more, uh, four most popular, um, lucrative I should say, fundraisers for us. The PAL draft, which is coming up on um, November 6th is a collaboration with our partners over in KCK PAL. Uh, we put this on at the Urban Youth Academy. The Royals are huge, uh, proponent of our program, Dayton Moore, loves it. So we get to do that as a donation at the Urban Youth Academy. It's a great venue. And we do all this through uh, grants as well. The Children's Services Fund uh, has been huge for us over the last few years, but there's, there's several great um, grants that apply specifically for our PAL program. Mahomes, who's gonna turn it around here next week is also... Uh, <laughs> 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 that's a that's a pal band that um, actually we, we received through a Bank of America grant and donated that to the department so we could purchase that band for a pal. And I show this picture because uh, that's at our last pal draft uh, fundraiser. But those are pal officers and sergeants um, with Joel Goldberg. And the reason I share that is because look, it, it's it's pretty easy to see how you take community and you take um, officers working together and it really is important for the kids, their families, and our community. But equally as important is it's important for our officers to see this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, officers, when they're out on the streets, sometimes see the worst and the worst of society, and it's easy to get kind of a, a jaded, cynical view on, distorted view on, on society. And what PAL kind of org organically does is it invites officers, volunteers, to be a part of that and actually see the kids and the families in their environment and then it understand, then you can understand why they are making the decisions that they are. And you don't have to condone the behavior, but you can understand it. Right. And once I understand it, then I can be part of the solution and actually gets me back to why I wanted to be a police officer in the first place to help and, and you know serve other people. So PAL is kind of an organic way of doing that. And to that point is it not that we do anything special, but we have, um, like I said, showed some pretty staggering figures. We have been a spotlight on um, other PALs across the country. This is the current list of PALs that have either come to Kansas City and model what we do, or we have gone there and presented to their command staff, and they are now adopting what we do here in Kansas City. And you notice that list is not just in North America. Um, it also includes Australia, London, New Zealand, South, South Pacific Islands, and the United Kingdom. Um, we, our reach is literally worldwide. So they have a program over in the South Pacific that's called the Blue Lights, and Blue Lights is similar to ours, but they do it kind of as a scared straight program involving military and, and law enforcement. They've seen our program now, and they're like, hey, that's more inviting that you're just bringing kids in through sports. Mm -hmm. And it looks like that that's what it's about, but it's so much deeper than that. And we provide everything for our kids, and so it really does. And it's sustainable. It's something that is not just a one-time or a week-long it's a lifetime. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude and answer any questions you might have. Absolutely incredible presentation. And you said so many things that, you know, it, it does help the police officer understand the community and it helps the kids from the community see that police officers are, are real 
genuine people. So, uh, Mayor? Yep. Uh, thank you, Bishop. How, how long has the program been in Kansas City? So we started in, in 1998, but that was just, again, kind of a satellite. Really, within the last 20 years, it's been enhanced. Well, I'm, uh, I'm proud of the progress you made. So back when I used to go to the barbershop, uh, which was the late 90s and early 2000s, <laughs> it's moved on. Um, I would see these signs and, you know, somebody would tape it up. I got my hair cut at about 69th and Prospect. Uh, and we would hear a little, you know, you see a little bit about it. Um, just like how you improve that facility in Northeast, the amount of change that exists now, you know, and, and with respect to everybody who was involved back then, uh, this is really exceptional. And um, you may not know the, the councilman who spoke earlier today, but uh, sometimes he can even give me some stress in life. Uh, and occasionally he gives that to the chief and this board and all of that. But I love that he mentioned an officer that he had worked with in his youth. And that last point you made is absolutely right, which is that, you know, you, you have folks that get to, to know who you are. Our officers get to know the community. And it just makes a tremendous difference um, in, in the public and, and throughout our region. And so I just want to say thank you. Can't outdo your presentation. It was a very good one. But this is a perfect example of great collaboration. And you're to be commended personally because I know a lot of that time has likely been uncompensated over these years that you've been involved and that's not lost on us either, you and your colleagues, and please make sure they know that the board appreciates their work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I just want to say thank you, and as a businesswoman and commissioner, I would love to help volunteer any way I can and uh, come in, so we'll, we'll get together and talk. Okay, I'll thank hold you. you to it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'd like to invite you to any anytime you want to go down to the Powell Center, just get a hold of me and, and we'll set it up. But it's really worth going down and seeing, especially when an event's going on and see how everybody interacts. Yeah, yeah. if, if Bethany job. could send us maybe, especially the Christmas parties and those kind of things coming up or any kind of giveaways, send us the, the dates. Uh, I'm sure some of us would love to come. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have our um, one of our social workers, Lindsay Moran. She's going to come up and um, talk about what she's doing. And then she also has um, a special case that she worked on that she'd like to present on. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Murray, and I'm a social worker at Metro Patrol. I'm a uh, Tamara McIntosh, social worker at South Patrol. Um, we wanted to present today just a little bit on um, what's some trends we've been seeing in Metro and in South Patrol, particularly in terms of uh, domestic violence and how our program tends to get involved in those um, those cases and those situations. So we'll start out by letting Tamara kind of talk about a situation that she got pulled into. Okay, so uh, a call had came um, uh, dispatched on a Operation 100. Um, I was called out because we had a uh, victim witness uh, who was actually able to get out of the situation, and she was uncooperative um, with, with officers. So they called me out to um, see if I can talk to her uh, to get her to open up about what actually is going on in the house and what they may have, what they may need to be concerned about. Um, got there, um, talked to her. She she didn't want to talk to me at first. Um, had to get her away from um, officers because that was her, her trigger for, for the moment because she just wanted to go home. Um, had her get in the car with me, talked to her, and then I was able to transport her over to our command center to talk to detectives. Um, during that time, she actually um, opened up about what, what was going on, what had happened in the house. Who, who also is in the house? It was her... Um, two two females and four children. I believe, uh, and there were children still in the house at that time. Um, the Texas were able to were able to talk to her, and uh, um, the hostage negotiators were also able to uh, speak with her. Um, I was leaving, so I noticed that this was going to take a little bit longer than than I thought, and I had to reach out to a couple more of my uh, social workers to uh, help me out. Um, so we were all able to collaborate and work together. I had to call Lindsay. Uh, Miranda Metro to help me. Um, Matt, who was here at East Patrol, 
and uh, work that was a center. Um, it took a, a lot of us to get this uh, situation under control that day. And then Lindsay took over. <laughs> Tamara was able to make a lot of good contacts um, with that witness in terms of what was going on in the house and that information to be able to provide it to um, our TAC guys to be able to bring that to a safe resolution. Um, the Unfortunately, there's a long history in that situation with um, that, that family. Um, we had to get the Children's Division involved and collaborate with them and make sure that we were able to establish safety for those kiddos that were involved. Um, and then also to continue to provide um, for that witness because she was fearful of retaliation based on her cooperation with us. So um, across the board, all of us had kind of cooperated. I worked with the Children's Division. I know that Matt had worked with um, the witness where we had located, reloaded, located her for a little bit um, to make sure that we were able to get all the information that we needed to keep them safe, but also to make sure that um, our officers had what they needed to do their job. Um, since this time, I, I don't have it written down exactly, but I know we've had um, a DV-related homicide and we've had several other really high lethality DV situations. Um, our officers are really good about um, contacting us, whether to come to scene or to be involved in the um, response to those situations. Um, across all six divisions, domestic violence uh, makes for our, our top referral. Um, over a quarter of what we're doing right now as social services um, is in response to referrals for domestic violence. Some of the things we do, um, we're often called to scene if, if we can be. Um, we'll help with the lethality of protocol that you guys heard about. Um, we'll, we'll also try to coordinate with the with Rose Brooks um, or Synergy or whoever um, and, and making sure that as a group we're collaborating and safety planning for those individuals. Um, we assist with uh, making sure they have the information they need for ex parte orders of protection. Sometimes that means going with them to court. They don't feel safe going to court or they're concerned about using the court process. Um, some of that was online for a long time during COVID and that was really frustrating and confusing. So we were able to sit down with, with people and walk them through that process. Um, asking people to leave their home and asking them to relocate is not a comfortable thing. So if we're able to get items or belongings or things to make sure that they um, feel confident in leaving the situation that they're in, we want to do that as well. And then one of our big things is notifying our, um, our school districts. Kids who are involved with domestic violence are considered um, by statute to be homeless. So they qualify under McKinney-Vento for relocation, which means if we move them, uh, the school district is responsible for cabbing them to and from their schools so that despite all the change that's going on in their life, their, their school is a constant for them. So one of our jobs also is to make sure that the McKinney-Vento coordinators at the school districts are aware of what's going on so that they can make sure that those kids at least are staying with that one constant thing. Um, we've had this, this year, 2021, we've had 438 referrals for domestic violence so far. Um, 190 of those have been um, involved with the ex parte process in one way or the other, um, needing help with that. We reach out to our partners at Rosebrooks and Synergy, um, Newhouse and, and Hope House as well. Um, they are well-versed in the ex parte process and making sure that we can access those after hours and those emergency things. I had one recently where we worked with a lady and it was approved at midnight. So um, they know what to do and they know how to do those things quickly and get that done. So our job is really just to make sure that we're the, the, the link between those resources. We... Our next steps as far as what we're doing is continuing to work with our um, lethality assessment protocol. We had a recent meeting with some of our community members and our community partner agencies to talk about our role as social workers and where we can help facilitate some of the communication after that initial call to um, advocates has been made where we can we can maybe follow along a little bit and, and make sure that we're linking people back up, whether it's the next morning or the next day, those kinds of things to make sure that they're having access to the the resources that those community agencies provide. And then just to continue looking at our data and um, our, our collection of um, where we're being used, how we're being used, and how we can improve that or, or, or grow that. So um, that's our involvement in, in domestic violence cases currently. And um, again, just because our officers continue to look for opportunities to put us in those situations and to, to plug us in um, when we're on scene, it's not uncommon that people feel more comfortable talking to us. Um, and so Often they will kind of stand to the side and listen and take the notes that they need while, you know, people feel a little bit more comfortable having that conversation with us as social workers instead. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. And we're open to questions. When you say you got an ex parte at midnight, that means that's a judge saying this person's going to be protected. It is. So yes. it's all through the system up to the court that they're getting up at midnight and giving those court orders, right? It is, yes. Good, thanks. It's, 
it's through those collaborations with our community partners who have those contacts and are able to do those things for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great report. There's a lot of great things happening yes. that that shows that there are efforts to work with the community. And you know, it's it's about balance as far as I see it. And uh, Chief, it's it's a lot of good things going on in the department. All right, okay. more. Thank you. Um, we're getting the PowerPoint. Um, it's up on the screen right now. Just going through a few things that our patrol divisions worked on during the last month. So this was a food drive. Uh, we partnered with Harvester's Call for Action and EverJ to give away items, food and hygiene, hygiene items to the community. This is a, a Faith in Blue weekend, which was held night to get everybody involved. More Faith in Blue, the picture on the left with uh, Officer Bird at one of the churches out south on Warnall, and the other picture um, on the right, that one is at the Rock of Casey Church. This was National Prescription Drug Take Back Day, it was this last Saturday, and I do have the stats from that. We were able to get 2,167 pounds of prescription drugs, which is huge. Those are drugs that will not be consumed by someone else that they weren't meant for. It keeps them out of, out of our water system. So it's great that we were able to get um, that many drugs off this. They were there. They loved the program. They were there recruiting other students to come. We had a packed house of students and their parents who were all interested in coming out. So we did recruit quite a few new people um, from this event. Drive through where in partnership with Lakeside Center, where the children received not only treats, but were able to get them exposed to different kinds of animals and snakes and birds. And <laughs> <laughs> This is the South Patrol trunk or treat. They just had a really good time. Um, you know, they decorate their, tr their trunks of the cars and then people can drive through and get treats. Another uh, uh, trunk or treat. This one is um, just a lot of people. A lot. Of, it's a great time for everyone. This is our youth police initiative. The boys and girls did a five day uh, youth police initiative. Fifteen teens and some KCPD officers came out. They spent the week participating in activities and discussions and fo focused on strengthening the relationship between the community and the officers. Is this during school? I don't. I don't believe it was. Uh, I don't think it was during school. I think it was after school. That's it for the slideshow. I do have um, a video I want to show. The weekend of October 8th through 11th was Faith in Blue weekend. It was a partnership between quite a few churches throughout all of Kansas City, and Jason Cooley did an amazing job. He worked tirelessly setting all of this up, and then our media unit pro produced this video. Church for hosting this Human Trafficking Training Center event. I'm also a chaplain here for KCPD. So we're really thrilled to be able to host this event. We're, we're bringing in these experts who are training our community. We're live streaming this event as well for across Kansas City and anyone across the country who has access to the stream to be able to learn how to recognize um, human trafficking, understand that better, and be able to, to respond to that. Yeah, I'm Nicholas Newport with uh, Evergy and Spire. We co-deliver an energy savings kit program uh, where we specifically target low-income neighborhoods uh, to bring them some LED light bulbs, low-flow shower heads, aerators, reduce their energy bill, do an hour-long walk through their house to help them identify additional ways to reduce their bill, uh, and save each person about $50 a year on average. Uh, so it's really great partnership to come out here to these community events and, and get right to the communities we want to help 
uh, serve. Yeah, so today we're working with the community policing um, in the Kansas City metro areas, and we are doing a, a food giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, actually a, a red bridge uh, block party that we have going on in, in KCPD and partnered with uh, the South Kansas City Chamber. Um, they're the ones that kind of put on the event. We're, we get to be a, a part of it. I think that just it, that was just an amazing weekend where we touched so many people all throughout the city, and uh, we look forward to next year's events. Um, again, and it's a national program, and in the metro area, it was not only us that participated, also other jurisdictions throughout the metro participated in um, these different types of events in their communities. So it was great. We really look forward to next year. Um, and in your book, my reports are located under tab F. It's the crime information, the summary from August, and then also the traffic summary. Deputy I, Chief, may I just speak, uh, they speak, they briefly speak to the video? Um, I, I just wanted to note one significant concern. I saw Officer Cooley in a lot of videos, but is he too slow for the basketball court? <laughs> I want to see if he's still got a crossover or anything. Now, I'm, uh, I will play you next time. But now, more seriously, it was uh, I was able to make a few events. I know Bishop Tolbert, I saw it at several as well. It was a, a very good set of events that brought all walks of life out. Um, people from the neighborhoods, some who were unhoused, all types of things, having a chance to be a part of the community with our officers. So thank you all and everyone who took a part in it. Thank you. And I'll answer any questions you have about either the traffic summary or the August crime reports. If not, not. that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, great presentation.
All right, we are moving on to department staffing. Uh, Deputy Chief Hicks. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to start with a video um, about our crime scene unit that was uh, shown by KSHB TV 41. I think it really shows the hard work of our uh, crime scene unit and what they do for this city and helping to solve crimes. Sorry, Colonel, that was just the audio. We're working on that right now. Hicks, did you put it anywhere else? Besides this desktop, it's in the public. Under yeah, what? DC. 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 Looks like a. Looks like some apparent blood on the bottom. This may look like a scene from your favorite crime drama, but this is real life training for crime scene investigators right here in the Metro. And today they took us through what they do from start to finish. In a story you'll only see on KSHB 41, reporter Emma James got an in-depth look at the process with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. KCPD's Crime Scene Investigations Unit is made up of 16 people. They don't work as sworn police officers. When they show up to a crime scene, they have a lot of work to do, and they're passionate about doing right. It all starts with documentation. Investigators take photos of a crime scene, documenting the scene, how it was when they arrived. After that, investigators process the evidence, whether it's collecting fingerprints and blood or finding out the trajectory of a bullet. It's like 3.7 upwards. It's a long and meticulous process. It's time consuming and, and it's time consuming because uh, of the nature of the work, but it's time consuming too because we want to do it right and we only get one chance to do it right. So we'll mm -hmm. use this throughout a scene and just move from room to room to room. Thanks to grant money, investigators started using 3D scanners in 2019 to help process the scene. Previously, they had to sketch scenes and take measurements by hand. The technology does the job much quicker and gives a more enhanced view of the scene to investigators, prosecutors, and even a jury if needed. Investigators like Lori Keller say every day on the job is new and different. It is a very interesting job. It's extremely rewarding. Keller says everyone on the unit works tirelessly to get justice for the people of Kansas City, no matter the crime. We have people who have lost loved ones or, you know, it could be, you know, that their home got burglarized. And these are all very important and traumatic situations that happen to people. After a scene is processed, evidence goes back to the lab where it's preserved. The detailed work done now is crucial for the future when that important evidence could be needed at any time. The other side of the couch. In Kansas City, Emma James, KSHB 41 News. I think that shows how hard our crime scene unit is working uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, responding to crime scenes to process those things, to assist our detectives in solving those crimes and helping to bring uh, these suspects to justice. The personnel summary is behind tab E. As of September 30th, KCPD has 1,744 members. Of this, 1,204 are law enforcement with 26 academy recruits and 506 non-sworn personnel, plus the five board members. As of today, KCPD has 1,723 members, an October loss of 21 members. As the year ends, we project another 30 to 35 members will leave KCPD, 
which will per, put KCPD's law enforcement workforce at 1196. We are hiring and in October, we added two lateral officers as well as a few more non-sworn members. The hiring of non-sworn personnel is going well and we should see an increase of appointments of non-sworn members in the coming months. By the end of 2021, KCPD will have a workforce that is similar to the mid-1990s. For example, in 1990, KCPD had 1,169 law enforcement members with a population of Kansas City of 427,000 and calls for service around 495,000 dispatched calls for service. In 2020, KCPD had 1,286 law enforcement members with a net, now we know a population of 509,000 and calls for service in the, 500, in the 520,000 range. By the end of 2021, we'll be down to 1,170 law enforcement members. And that puts us right around 1997. So we anticipate, we already know we're going to lose members in January and February. They've already uh, filled out paperwork. Um, we do have now 25 members in the, or uh, recruits in the police academy, but they don't graduate until March and not be part of the workforce until May because they have to go through break-in and they won't be on their own until, Mar until May. Do you have any questions? I have a question. Um, I've read that there's $17 million that we could be using to give raises to our officers and to have more recruiting classes. What's that about? Um, I'll defer that to uh, Colonel Niemeyer because he uh, handles the Executive Service Bureau for money. So the, the question is about the 17.4 million? Yes. Okay, That's, that, that, that was on the budget sheet, um, which is schedule one of the budget sheet. For this I, year? Correct. Okay. Well, and last year. Well, but I'm, I'm, I wanna talk about the year we're in right now. Right now, okay. Can you, can somebody pull up? Yes, please. So pull this up. So the $17.4 million that you're asking about. Yes. So that's, well, that's, that's called salary savings. Um, and the definition for that is estimated money for the gap in time that positions are not filled during the budget. So at the beginning of last year, we self-assessed ourselves $5.4 million. We thought that we'd have a savings of that amount of money. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's not a savings. It's we self-assess it, so it's it's unappropriated. We don't we don't receive it. The city uh, never gave us that money. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay. Go so ahead. So then there's an additional twelve million that was assessed as well. By the city. Yes. Okay. So that's unappropriated funds. That means we don't receive those funds. We don't receive the funds. We don't have it in our budget. No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't come over because it's a. It's already assessed. It's unappropriated, which means it doesn't come over to us. Um, so it's it's held on to by the city. So those funds are not. Those funds weren't received. All right. Um, it, could we have it to, don't, tomorrow if we wanted it? Could we just say we want that seventeen million? No. Okay. Right. The 5.4, we, we didn't ask for because we self-assessed ourselves. We knew we'd have this amount of openings. We knew we'd have this amount of openings. So we don't, we're not going to pay those openings. So we don't get that funding. That's what, that's why we say it's called self-assessed salary savings. If we don't have the officers, we don't pay them, right? Correct. But if we wanted today to hire new officers, we wouldn't be able to use that 17 million to do that, would we? We don't have that 17 million. So the, we didn't. We didn't. We don't receive that. And we can't get it now. No. The city would have to do something to give us that money. Correct. Yeah. We, okay. I mean, that money is. The money was never received because it's a a savings and then the extra 12 million, the second 12 million 
was self-assessed or not self-assessed was assessed by the city. Um, they said, you're, you're not going to get that much money. Right. Because that was, that was during the second, well, that was pre-budget last year before, before it was. So whoever's saying uh, that we've got 17.5 million doesn't know what they're talking about. Is that right? Well, we don't have the $17.4 million in okay. our bank. And speculation about the other part, but we <laughs> never had it. We never had the $17.4 million. It's, it's in a budgetary situation. It never was transferred from the city to us into okay. our account. But are you saying we saved the city $17 million by making that self-assessment? Well, the, the, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the first is a 5.4 that we assess ourselves because we know we have this amount of openings. Mm -hmm. So the city doesn't send us that portion. Okay. The second was assessed as it was assessed for everyone in all departments. Ours was Our portion was 12 million, so we didn't receive that. So the budget, they told us we needed to cut our budget. The 12 million came when the city said every department need to cut across the board. Our, our part of that across the board cuts of the city was $12 million. So there's another 3 million that the city was going to give us for recruiting classes. Once the litigation was over, at least that's what we were told. Have we gotten that? No. So they haven't given us anything for new recruiting classes. That's correct. Not in, not in this budget. As well, we're talking about I'm, this I'm year. Ta I'm talking about this year. I would love to have another recruiting class tomorrow and we need the money. So they haven't given us any of that. Now there was a city ordinance that was introduced and went to committee. That was for new officers too, right? There, there's a ordinance that's getting introduced this week. I, it may be today that Been talked introduced. about new officers. But it went to the it's been in committee for legal review because yeah. that's that's the one that I thought you said was going to be in front of the city council two months ago and it's or a month ago and held for two months. Do we know why? I believe. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm going to have a diatribe too when we're ready. But my okay. But the logic is very simply that we're in a legal dispute about money in the city. So I think the idea was not to take action on it prior to the resolution. But they're going to take action now that it's I, over. I, I can't speak to that. No. Okay. So again, our academy class that we have now is because we've had an over projection of, of lead at this point in time. And that's how we put 30 people in the academy. That, that's the only reason why we have 30 people in the academy. Bottom line is right now, we don't have money for anything else. Is that right? Well, I, I wouldn't say that. I would say that we will watch how many more people leave for the end of the year again we're we're past our expected rate so you know if if 35 or 40 people leave that's going to open up positions um that maybe had been closed that we wouldn't be able to fund and money yeah we don't want people to leave i i'm with you on that our, our as as deputy chief hicks pointed out um this is getting very um you know, we our, our, as we talked about our impact squads, you know, we, they've been redirected to help answer calls for service in, this, in, in their zones in which they're at. Um, we've had to make other um, adjustments as we go um, because we don't have any other people. And, and again, this came up with the downtown footbeat. It, it's not that the police department doesn't want to have a downtown footbeat. It's the fact that all the members of downtown footbeat have retired mm. and they have left the force. And we don't have enough bench depth to put six more people back into that by taking six people out of the field. And that, frankly, that's where we're standing with our resources and our workload. The, the calls for service, I would call, is our core mission, right? That is our citizens reaching out every day for a police response when they need officers. And that is whether it's north of the river, south of the river, or anywhere in between. That's our workload. That is drive by the citizens of the city when they call or the community or who's ever here who calls 911 within the city boundaries and says we need a police response. In order to meet that need, we have to have people. That, that's the only way we meet those needs are with people.
And as we can see, you know, we're, we're getting close of, from when I was chief, almost down 200 people difference. Well, that takes a toll on the organization. One of the public comments said that the earnings tax was put in place since before I was in Kansas City. In order for us to have 1,300 officers, or 14, I can't 15. remember. 1,500. 1,500. In 1968. Is that true, that that's why the earnings tax was put in place? That's the articles I've read from 1968. That's what was in there, yes. So we have the earnings tax, but we don't have the officers. That's correct. I don't know. Could you discuss the can I, airport? Can I ask real quick, just because it relates to this line, and I'm, I haven't practiced law as long as uh, Commissioner Dean, so my cross-examination is, is worse. <laughs> but in today's docket, and, and this, this is a concern for me, and maybe there's great confusion because I actually am a simple person. I'm an attorney, but I look at a document that says adopted budget 1,413 officers. It doesn't say adopted budget 1,200 officers at the end of the year. I might ask why, but before you answer that, I will also note we're saying today we don't have enough officers from salaries to help fund even a downtown foot patrol, but we're asking for a transfer. The department asked for a $300,000 transfer today from salaries to legal expenses. So if we were having a problem with enough officers to, here's my take. This is a priorities question fundamentally. And so we can say the city of Kansas City has failed us for the last 60 years since the passage of the earnings tax. I won't take that hit on, I guess, Mayor Bartle or Mayor Davis or Mayor Kemp or whomever was around that since then. But I think there's a very clear question as to what does self-assessed salary savings even mean? Excluding the 12 million from the city, we can get to that in a moment. And by the way, as a mayor who had to help craft a budget, we had a lesser reduction for the police department than most any department in Kansas City with the exception of fire. But why are we assessing a $5.4 million self-assessment on salary savings when we're saying the most challenging thing we have is the number of officers that are out on the streets? Per the ordinance that's before city council, that's two classes, two recruiting classes in and of itself. Why are we even doing the self-assessment? Let's start simply. Well, because um, at, at the beginning of the budget year, those are positions that are unfilled. That but they're unfilled. I mean, we. The question is $5.4 million, though. Why are we self. So you're saying those are unfilled at the beginning of the year. So if, if we have $5.4 million extra that was not cut by the city of Kansas City, why don't we use that $5.4 million to hire officers? The $5.4 million never came to the police department, Mayor. It never came here. We can't That's, use money we don't have. The, so, who, who so cut, cut it? Cut. So I'm hearing there was a, and cut's really not the right phrase, because we do. Yes, I, agree. Budget I agree with zero you, it's not year. a cut. But is, are we saying that the five, so you're, uh, I'm starting to get the thesis, so just so I can understand. Is the theory that the department needed $17.4 million more to hire anyone new? Is that what the? Can I, can I try this? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> It's difficult for me to understand, to be sure, but sure. the 1,413 officers is a starting point. We Good knew way. from that, from the beginning of budget, we'd never get that 1,413. We couldn't even have got those. We couldn't have hired that many people in a short amount of time anyway. From a, Okay, so we, we came up with a realistic number that we thought we could get at budget time, and it was around 1,350, okay, and whatever that dollar amount is, that freed up that five million. We knew we didn't even have to ask for that five four point four million in budget talks, so we didn't ask for that. We asked for what the dollar amount that would get us thirteen hundred and fifty ish officers mm -hmm. in the budget negotiations with the city. They funded us enough for twelve hundred. Okay, and that's where the, they took twelve million away from what we were asking for. They took twelve million away, and it was city assessed as other departments were they so the 1400 is a starting point the realistic number that we were funded for was closer to 1200 and that explains why a we didn't ask for 5.4 million dollars and then when we asked for a specific number the city said we'll give you 12 million less then that would fund 
1,200 officers plus the remaining, that's for, that's for officers, and then the remaining part of that budget, 6% of the budget, is for the daily operations of the police department. That's, so, as, that's as, I, as simple as I can make it, and I hope it I, helps. But. Mike makes it simple because he's asked me to make it Mike Wood simple. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so that's why he's talking. He's like, hey, we got to make it simple so Mike can understand it. And, I, and I'm going to try to do the same. So if I can just back up, Mr. Mayor, and, and answer your question about the 1413, that's, that's FTE, right? That's having been at the city, that's the FTE of every department sure. um, at the city. Um, and for those who don't know, FTE, we call it TO here. Um, that's full-time equivalent positions. That's what every city department has. Every city department has a number. That number does not change. If it's the, as, as I've spoken to many of the uh, different departments at the city, their FTE number doesn't change. But how many employees they have. So each city department has their own salary savings assessment to begin with. Just like we do. We're our, our budget doesn't totally separate from any other department that's in the other the other departments there. So when it says 1413, it's not necessarily meaning the budget's not meaning that we're funding 1413 when that budget gets passed. What it means is that's how many FTEs we have, but the budget, when it comes in, there's that specific number, whatever that specific number is each year, that will fund this amount of officers. That FTE number won't change whether it's us or it's the parks department or it's the water department or, or any other department. So I think that's where that 1413 number gets confusing for, for, for a lot of people. It was confusing for a lot of people in the police department. They're like, but it says 1413. Well, it's the way the budget system is set up with all those departments. Can I, can I ask one question related to that though? Yes, sir. Because the way, and, and maybe it's just the way I've seen it at City Hall, as I view it, we will give a budget, let's use a non-police department department, public works, right? And if they have, and they have a lot of FTEs actually, if the director of public works has an interest in, let's say, not buying salt that year and not buying any new trucks, the director of public works has ordinance authorization to fill up all of his employee positions. I, I, and I, I think that's just the case. And so then it becomes a situation where the director is making some sort of decision as to what he budget values, right? I, I don't make a decision on how many, except for an ordinance being needed, I don't make a decision on the trucks or the salt or the routes or anything like that. The only decisions we make are initial budget and then of course the number of employees that they're allowed to have. And so I, I'm, I guess I'm having trouble in some ways seeing the difference because in this one, I understand that you're, you're saying, and I think we can agree on this, you're saying, well, the police department can budget up to 1413 and can't exceed it necessarily, although I would argue the board, if we wished, could. Um, but we're electing not to go up to that 1413 number because we didn't think that there was sufficient funding from the city this year to help support. But correct. Right. On on some, the other, the other issue is this, is we can't ask per, per chapter 84, we can't ask for money and say, we're going to hold this money and, that we don't know if we can spend. So, um, I, and I think more, one of my items is the budget for next year. I think we're going to go much deeper in depth tomorrow about it. And I yep. think that's probably where that discussion belongs. Right. Um, and there, and that uh, portion of that. But I, to answer whether or not we could academy classes, my, mm -hmm. my brain's thinking faster and I can talk. Uh, academy classes, if we had three academy classes last year, we budget for that academy class that would start, let's say May 1. We know their salary is gonna be this long. We budget only if the next class is gonna start up in September, we budget for that amount of money that it would cost from September to May 1. If we had a third class in February, we only ask for the money from February to May 1 because that's the money that we can spend. That's how, that's how we ask for the money to pay for salaries and employees. We can't ask for money that we don't have the ability to spend. So, so Mayor, if you allow me to do this, since we are having a budget discussion tomorrow from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. in this room, if there are some things we need to pass today, 
let's get those passed and then let's go with an in-depth budget conversation tomorrow. I will respect that. I will reject the assertion that anyone who's confused by this is in some way trying to either distract the public or anything of the sort. Perhaps we're used to looking at every other departmental budget. If we actually fund up to a certain number, then usually a department has the ability to hire it up if they find cost savings, if there are no snowstorms, for example, in public works. And so I think that myself as a member of the public and many others might have that same question. I also still, Deputy Chief Wood helped me start to get there, still don't quite understand, even removing the 12 million from the city, the 5.4 million self-assessment, um, i.e. KCPD or this board self-assessed ourselves, these types of this amount that theoretically could be used somewhere unless the contention is we needed all that extra. I'll make one, I guess, two final points. One is, and again, it, I'll just say this. When the pandemic hit at City Hall, what I told the then acting city manager was, we're not going to lay off anybody. That meant that all the pain that went somewhere else right, was being applied to other city operations, divisions, we're postponing contracts, we're doing other things, because fundamentally we needed to take care of our people and actually have at least enough response to do the things that Kansas Cityans expect. So I do think that personal services, et cetera, should be a priority. I don't understand why, to the extent the city didn't give all that was requested, the only people who get hit are actually those in personal services, our employees, pay raises, step increases, all those sorts of things, rather than, for example, what we would do in public works, no new trucks, some of the other gear. I also don't understand how we are even saying we don't have enough officers to walk a set of streets, but I have a $300,000 salary request to move from salaries to something different today that's before us right now. And so I, I'll look for those sorts of answers because I do think that there's real confusion there. And we're in a bizarre kind of situation with how it's set up. But I think that that could be helpful for all of us in understanding it better. And so I'll, I'll take your invitation to ask more <laughs> tomorrow. If I, can, if I can just address it while it's on the table. Yes, sir. The $300,000 transfer is, is going to pay for salaries. We're transferring it from it would be transferring from patrol to detention because those officers were put on special assignment in detention. Those, okay. those, those salaries are, they're still salaries. They're, they're just being moved from here to here to be paid out of detention services or out of executive services. Whereas the way our budget is, if I was the East Patrol Division commander, this was how much was budgeted for East Patrol. But if, those, if that officer that was an East Patrol DFO is moved into a centralized DFO group, that money is moved out of um, there, there to, to the other spot. So that's part that's part of one of them, and, I, and and that'll be one of my budget transfer items. I think that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think, but I I don't have it pulled up right in front of me until it's my turn because it's I get the business issues here at the board. Um, so I I will read through it whenever we get to that. But I think that's what you're talking about. I'm not positive. Yet. Thank you. So, I don't have any trouble understanding the, that, uh, you know, the, the five million or whatever that we didn't get, didn't ask for and didn't get from the city. I don't have any trouble understanding that we took, uh, you know, $12 million hit to the budget. So I don't, you know, those, those seem fairly well presented. I'd so say. so, so I'll just, I'll just can, say can we do this tomorrow? tomorrow? Anything has to do with budget. Uh, that's why we're having three hours set aside to do that, because we could go on and on and back and forth. Is this about budget? No, this is about recruiting. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a recruiting question. All right. And that is something I know I mentioned to the chief. We're talking about you know, we need, we're going to be 200 short, we need new recruits, we need people coming in. So my question is, you know, I would like to see something in the surrounding communities saying, you know, what are the other communities paying their officers as far as wages? And what is the retention? Because to me, being in Kansas City, and, you know, a brand new officer, you're taking on a lot of risk. And to me, Kansas City should be at the top of that pay scale because 
it's it's not a gladstone. It's not a place where you're not going to take on as much. And so I was just wondering if we could get something showing how do we compare. That's a roundabout way to talk about budget. Well, no, <laughs> it's about retention and how do we compare to other communities? Because I think that's part of maintaining, getting people, yeah. you know, to come in. Because if we're obviously having a hard time attracting recruits, there's a reason. Yes, I'd like to go back to budget. I, at Commissioner Kramer and I have had some discussion on this. We we do have a short Excel spreadsheet to show the differences of the sheet. Um, uh, Brad Lemon from the FOP is, has had the information. We have that um, that we can put up if you want to see it today. Yeah, let's do it tomorrow. Do it tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Because it, it, go, it goes right back to budget. <laughs> All right. All right. You, true, are you? Who was doing a presentation? I'm I've lost now. It was me, and I'm done. You started this. Huh? I started this. I sure did. I'm gonna end it though. I'm done. I defer to the next deputy chief. All right. Uh, oh Lord. That means I, I might discussion. as well just continue. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Hicks. Uh, and you're okay. under tab. What, what's your tab? At B, and one of these one of these times I'm able to say good morning, but I think I'm the first person that gets to say good afternoon every single time. So, uh, okay, item one, oh, item one, budget transfers uh, for the 2021-22 20, uh, general fund 100, police grants fund 239, transfers $300,000 personal services and contractual services, providing appropriations to pay members on special assignment where they are currently assigned. Uh, I just said that about the detention services. And then the second fund, the police grant funds is transferring $67,000 from personal services to $50,000 for contractual and the amounts of 30,000 to commodities, 87,000 capital outlays adjustment. Um, uh, these are all, I believe these are all attached here on, on that item number one. And with that, I just would request your approval on those transfers within those accounts. I'm going to have a question for you, and it's the same question. And when I'm over at city council and people just just disagree, sometimes they can just vote no, and I'm going to do that too. But if I look at the attachment on the back page, and, and I thought it was this way, it says personal services, and it notes a $300,000 deduction in personal services, i.e. salaries. Under contractual services, it says chief of police legal fees, $300,000. So it looks as if this is not going to a reassignment of salaries. It's going to payment of legal fees taken from the salary line item. That's, that's just what one lawyer sees in the document. And maybe no one else on the board has an issue with that. I do when we're noting that we have budgetary issues. We don't have enough people to walk around the streets. Unless I'm reading this wrong too, it says salaries and then it goes to legal fees. And that's just succinctly, unless I can read it correctly, what it appears to show me. It's, it'll be contractual, yes, contractual legal fees for salaries. And what it is is, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, contractual legal fees for our legal folks that had just left um, to pay them until we replace our new council is that correct uh, okay. i don't understand I, I don't either so we we have we had uh jenny and jamie before in order to assist with our office of general counsel until we uh are fully staffed there this is an adjustment to pay them contractually to help with a legal issues that happen within the department so perhaps, to perhaps assist are you are you is the contention here that they are independent contractors and thus there will be a contractual relationship between the police department and our our new um attorney for the department can you say that again how you can you tell me that's a good question i believe what he's talking about is that i'm not enough currently um to hold down two spots. So in the interim and in the gap between when I came on and Jamie left, 
we are contractually employing people to help fill in work I can't get done. So we've got a gap of right now we have the office of general counsel. I'm filling the position of general counsel. We have no one in the associate general counsel position. So we are contracting to have assistance in filling two lawyer positions. Does that help? So, so we're contracting basically as, as opposed to salaries. We're moving that. We, ha we had that before. We're, we're moving the money over there to now pay that whenever we're not paying their salary out of a different area. Yeah, that, I, get it. It. I, just I, heard, I just heard that we don't have enough money to have six officers walking, let's say, downtown foot patrol. I'm saying I have $300,000, and right now I'm either voting to outsource that, taking it from salaries, and putting it into, and don't get me wrong, lawyers are exceedingly important to them. I agree. But, you know, I, I, I just, I don't the rationale, but I'll, I'll just vote no, and that's that's fine, and maybe nobody agrees, but it, it seems as if we're taking it from salary line item, it's going to legal fees, contractual services, and this is one example, if I took the time, perhaps there'd be several others that might create these very same concerns when we're asking the city, I think, to give more money towards patrol officers is our hope, and we're not putting that same money towards patrol officers. Would the statute allow us to take that 300000 and pay a patrol officer? I would, sorry. Counselor? I believe so. The money is appropriated. So we have requirements within certain categories that we must present to the city when we request appropriations for the budget, and then that is allocated to us. Um, so I think it still meets that um, requirement. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I would certainly recommend, and perhaps holding this after our budget chat could be one way we address the question of certain things that are listed as salaries and personal services going to the world of contractual services, which to me seems to be taking money from our salary line item that could go to officers instead. And, and, so, be, and because it is a public meeting tomorrow, if we held this and then deemed it necessary to pass it, we still could do that. Yes, sir. So uh, a motion to hold. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. Nope. So that is held. Next item. All right. Item number two is unappropriate JAG uh, grant funds. Basically, the department receives JAG grant funds from the city. Uh, since January 2015, those funds have always been used to fund client advocates through uh, paid through Arts Tech. Uh, the city has requested that we deobligate those funds for simplicity, and they contract directly with the client advocates. Uh, that was requested by um, the director of finance from the city, and we would recommend that we do unappropriate that $190,000 back to the city uh, in JAG grant funds that they had sent to us. I move approval. Is it a second? Second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. Uh, the, next, the next item is item number three. This will play into the uh, also with item number item number five uh, shortly. The request is uh, increase federal uh, seizure forfeiture funds from unappropriated uh, Inappropriate funds by $435,124, which is going to be used uh, on item number five, which is the Mo Motorola Consulates uh, to be to pay for them. Uh, and I'll discuss those after after this item. So we so, don't vote on it until after. All right, I can do item that. number five as well. Uh, so let me do item five uh, first. And and what tab is that under particularly? B, it's it's still under B. Yeah, it says adjustments to special revenue accounts. Um, the third item. B E. B E. You probably don't know this, but we have several different tabs like oh. tab b goes a b c d e 
So it's hard for us to find. Sorry. Benefits. That's all right. Now, something I was reading under one of these, I think it was the, the, the uh, consoles, that there is a Johnson County contract discount of $206,399. Is that in this one? Did that's, I read that? That's what this is. This Us appropriating these funds to this account is what's going to pay for those Motorola uh, consulates and MDCs. Or that's not correct, not MDCs. So but my question, I kept trying to find the thread as to why there's a particular $206,000 Johnson County contract discount. And it seems that we're partnering with them to get this whole uh, deal for Motorola, but I didn't see anything for Kansas City. So um, it almost looks like Johnson County is getting uh, a, a deep discount and Kansas City is footing the bill. I don't know. If it looked it, like that. I, I, I don't know if I'm the only one that, that uh, thought that, but I really would like to have some explanation on that. So there's 85. I, I'm I'm trying to find the page that you're you're on in the. Uh, let's see. I think I said it's it's page 21, tab B, section E. I wrote that down. So, so that's actually ours. Uh, I think this is if this is the correct page. We're 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 paying off of that contract. We are paying off of that contract. That's our discount. So but our total is at 435, says. 120, 124. Okay. We're right. working off of that. That's that's what we got. Okay. It's a discount. So that, that's not what it says. Is so it? it's a discount from Johnson County? No, for no, pairing up with Johnson from County, Motorola. right? From Motorola. Using that contract. Okay. It's a standard form contract that Johnson County has gotten that's done on the bids, and then we benefit from that discounted rate. Yeah, but I want to see what they're paying and what we're paying. We're not paying through Johnson County, are we? We're paying directly. Right. But that's we're getting that Johnson County discount. It's their, we're they, getting the they discount. They negotiated a contract, kind of like when we also sometimes buy off of a state contract. Right. 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 So they've negotiated a contract, and we're allowed to get the same terms that Johnson County's getting. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So we're getting the same discount, whatever it is. Johnson County, we don't know how much they're buying or how much they're doing, but we're getting the same deal. Is that right? Right. We're, there's 83 of these devices that are citywide. We, we're responsible for 45. 45, right. Yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't get to that because I was on item three. But when I read through the Motorola MC upgrades, there's 83 of them that's going to have to be replaced for the entire city, for the radio systems will work across the metro right. region. We are asking to replace 45 of those. That's why we work off of that so, as well. And I think part of this is uh, there's two hubs for radio <laughs> communications. There's us and Johnson County. So it, we work together on our systems for interoperability, both that side of the state line and our side of the state line. I think what happened is Johnson County at that communication hub went out and bid this contract. And that's why we're tying in onto this yes, correctly, because those are the two centers for the metro area. All I know is that when I read it, it talks about a Johnson County discount. I want to make sure that if they're getting 45, we getting 45, they're paying the same thing we're paying. That, that's what I want to be I assured of. I presume that's accurate. I, so I, but I don't want to assume that because you know what happens when you assume. It. So how do we how do we verify that <laughs> that discount is a discount that discounts the entire price, and then whatever's left over, they pay half, we pay half. I, I I'll tell you what. If if it would be okay, uh, since we held the other item, I can have the answer by tomorrow. And we can pass it tomorrow, and I get I will call them. And make and confirm well, that uh, that we do that. All right. So motion to hold. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right. Thank you. Okay. So 
So that was items five and three and five. Three. Hmm. Item four, I think we're probably going to hold, which is, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will just request that now. <laughs> so moved. Second. Second. All in favor by saying goodbye. Aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. All right. Item six, you've already approved. Yes. Shot spotter? Yes. Item seven is our police uniform contract renewal. Uh, the Board of Police Commissioners awarded Dahls a one-year contract in October of 2020 with the option to renew for three additional years. Uh, Dahls' uh, proposal here includes a 5% increase, uh, which, was a, which is in the limitations of this contract. Uh, the estimated cost of this is $512,302.12 for the next year. Uh, all the items that are covered are in that tab or in that item number. And I would request that we approve uh, an additional one year on the contract. I move approval. Second. All in favor by signing by? Aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I said. My last item uh, is a sub award revision uh, that involves the Kansas City Metropolitan Crime Commission. Previously awarded KCPD $237,367 as Project Safe Neighborhoods. We had $20,618 in unspent personnel and benefits due to the hiring process uh, delays. The Crime Commission is going to reprogram that unspent money to uh, their media campaign, and we would recommend that that be approved. Is this the $20,618? Yes, sir. And so... Do they have plans for how they're going to specifically use that? The reprogramming the funding, it says in their media campaign, um, it's money that we we did not, we weren't we weren't able to spend. Right. So uh, it needs to go back to the crime commission for their. That's what they they've told us they're going to reprogram it as as a media. Okay. With approval. Second. All in favor by signing by. Aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I said. That's all I have. All Unless right. you have any other questions. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will be here. Uh, I will definitely be here and hopefully be able to answer all the questions yes, tomorrow. Sir. Thank you. Uh, on everything. Uh, Office of Community Complaints. No. We skipped that. Professional Did I skip something? Yes. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Professional Development and Research Bureau. Mine's going to be real quick. I'm under tab C. Just a quick update for the recruit classes. The 172nd due to uh, graduate in December is at eight officers all outside. Um, the 173rd is at 39. Um, 26 of those are ours. I know it shows 20, 29 in yours, but since this was made we've we've lost three we're down to 26. i will say we feel really good about the 26 they're strong strong candidates so that that's the good news there um we were looking at the for for the consent agenda that peer support team we were looking to rescind that we're going to hold that if it's okay with you with the board because we're writing a new policy that's going to explain how the FOP is going to the FOP, and if and when that's approved, it will automatically rescind this policy. So we'll just hold that today. Yeah. And that's, that's it. All right. Thank can, you. I, can I just ask a quick question on this? Yes. I mean, have we approved the contract which allows for the FO, which has the FOP program running this though right now, correct? Or, or does the peer support team still exist? Yes, there is a peer support team. It's it's really running under this policy, but all along, the mm -hmm. FOP has been the ones that have been carrying the water to this for this. And as we change it over in the new policy, it's just going to explain that it's their project to run, yep. and they're doing a great job with it now, and, and it should be theirs anyway. So we're just going to have the policy reflect that. Okay. Understood. And that's Lodge ninety nine. 
Yeah, because one of the questions that I had was, if if a person is not a member of the FOP, do they still are they still covering them with the peer support? Absolutely, and right. they it's it's really not even just our department. They go out and help. They were in independence in that unfortunate incident. That uh, it's metro wide. They they do a wonderful job. Great. All right, um, Office of General Counsel. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm still very excited to be here. My information is under tab G. The first is the monthly summary for the private officers licensing unit. The second item is the appeal from the August 19th, 2021 Denial of application for an armed private security license based on a prior resignation from two law enforcement agencies in regards to an incident. The supporting documentation is included and provided. If you have no questions, we'd submit this for appeal determination. Any questions? I think we should deny the appeal. So I make that motion. Second. All in favor of denial? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I said it. Appeals denied. Thank you. That's all I have for today. All right. Thank you. Uh, Office of Community Complaints Update. Oh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, Commissioner Toby, you and I previously spoke. I'm going to request that I push my report to um, next month's meeting where we'll be discussing um, the development of the community advisory committee that was talked about at last month's meeting. Good, excellent, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, public comments. And um, Richard, I think it's Palm, Palmer. Palmer or Palmer. Richard, are you here? Can you leave? All right. Uh, Ms. Cheryl Ferguson? Um, trying to figure out where to begin, but I'll just start with some information that I went ahead and pulled up. CNBC. As of June 29th this year, said that Americans over the past year had lost $29.8 billion in phone scams. Per Statista.com, 1990 through 2020, now I'm speaking of robbery type cases. So the research that I did or the search that I did for was for robbery type cases, which would be like my phone got stolen from me as I was walking down the street, things of that nature. They didn't have a dollar amount for me. But what they did provide me is that in 2020, there were 73.9 cases per 100,000 people, which was down from 1990 of 257 per 100,000 people. So just kind of taking a look at number wise of who's impacted of an actual smaller level offense, depending on how you, you know, the crime plays out versus the larger dollars that are actually impacting people. Most of you guys have heard me talk about the fact I work customer service. I work customer service for a credit card company. When people authorize a transaction, even if they are being frauded, they are not covered. Where you see, discover, advertise, you are not responsible for unauthorized charges. But when you get strong-armed over the phone because you have fear and they've told you what they're going to do to you if you don't go buy this gift card, they are not covered and that is their loss. We've seen stories of the news of there's one woman here locally that lost $70,000 in scams of that nature. Why am I bringing that up? August 17th, a tweet from KC police. We received a call today stating that we had placed a $700 order for an iPhone 11 through Amazon. The automated system advised to press one to speak to someone if we did not place the order. So we did. We then advised them that they were scamming the KCPD and they should stop. 
This is not the first scam call to the KCPD has received. Block, ignore, or do whatever you need to do to avoid these scams. It just dumbfounds me that I've actually watched somebody on TikTok play their game to find out the information, to get interaction of the bank account that she actually went to go create an account to play the game along with the fraudster to try and catch him. Common everyday citizen, but she documented it for TikTok. But you guys here had an opportunity. And I'm sure there's probably been more since. I'm constantly getting text messages that I know better than to click on the link. When I'm looking at the protect and serve, if you guys aren't even trying to do the effort to find out who's committing these crimes, and we know that the common everyday citizen does not have the same common sense that I would working in the financial industry for 30 years, who can they rely on? We make them go get a police report, and I will tell you that we investigate, but as a bank, we only investigate to make sure we're not to blame, that we haven't done anything to compromise their information. I would expect whether or not the person that's taking that call is a sworn officer or not, they represent KC police. I am not in the fraud department, but I know to listen for certain clues and I'll play the game and I'll try and get them over to the fraud team. There's, there's so much fear of needing more officers, but there's so many opportunities that you could better skill the people you already have. Why would you just say you probably shouldn't scam the KCPD? You guys should be the people out here protecting and serving the community to try and stop crime. $29.8 billion. It's quite a big industry. Your turn to protect and serve. Thank you, Ms. Virgil. Uh, Rachel Riley, and I might ask those who are speaking to watch the screen. You have two minutes. Yeah, please go over to the podium. If you don't mind, my daughter's going to hand you. Um, That's fine. Um, I actually sent in some information regarding um, my two sons' cases that I'm going to speak about. I think I have one already. And if it pleases the commission board, I did speak with uh, Bethany. Is it Ruoff? Yes. To ask for um, some extra minutes. Good morning to the commissioner board. Um, let me take a minute because I'm already emotional here. Thank you for your attention today. My name is Rachel Riley. I am a caring servant and neighborhood leader. My due diligence and willingness to care has allowed me to continue serving the residents and people of my community for the last 19 years free of charge. Unfortunately, I am also a mother of two murdered sons and I need your support. My, excuse me. My son, Larry Riley, was murdered on October 30th, 2003. His case is still unsolved 19 years later. Larry was tall, handsome, caring, and intelligent, and an intelligent young man with a big heart of gold. If he was alive today, he would say, Mama, I don't want you to hurt anymore. Please let me go. I need your support of receiving the legal documents that states differently. According to previous prosecutors, Larry's homicide case is closed as a self-defense case yet there's no suspects. Unfortunately, those documents have been unattainable. Why? A tip reward of 25,000 with information leading to the arrest of murdered victim, Larry Cornelius Riley, must be presented. Or disclose the facts, not theories, why the closing of his case has not been rectified. Please help Larry's family seek justice for his death. 
There's also, unfortunately, the death of my youngest son, John Riley, who we believe was murdered on January the 10th this year, 2021. John, too, was a handsome, smart, and athletic young man. <laughs> much like his big brother, Larry, too, much like his big brother, Larry, he, too, was no stranger to caring about people. If John was alive today, he would say, Mama, take care of my little sister and my sons. Mama, I don't want you to hurt anymore. Let me go. We need the commissioner's board support to request phone records from John's phone, which he had on him at the time of his death. Unfortunately, these records were never reviewed by Kansas City Police Department. These records will give us the peace we need knowing John's last moments, what may have transpired prior, excuse me, prior to his death. I requested three times from Chief Rick Smith not to let a certain detective by the name of Perry, who was handling John's case. This is due to what we perceived as racist behavior. Chief assured me that Detective Perry would not handle my son's case. I stated that I felt my son would not receive justice. Yet, Detective Perry handled my son's case anyway, in spite of my request. As Detective Perry closed Rachel, my son's Rachel, case- Rachel, let me just ask you a quick question, okay? And, and our condolences to you. I don't want to do anything and say anything here that may jeopardize a case against someone who harmed your sons. And so if we could not talk about the detective and we could not talk about that, and I'd be happy to meet with you. I know any other commissioners would, but in a public meeting, I don't want to jeopardize any future case. Is, is that all right? Yes, that's okay. fine. And so I'll just finish. And if we could just uh, move from that part. Thank you. Out of concern regarding John's case, we spoke with the medical examiner's office. In disbelief, we would be traumatized all over again. To have the Kansas City Police called on you and being removed from the office for asking too many questions regarding your loved one's case is unacceptable. Larry and John believed in God. We ask and we pray that this commissioner board's, commissioner's board help us seek requested records and answers for for a more thorough investigation regarding Larry and Jean's case. I, my family and community has had faith in the various law enforcement that has had a heart for our community. Larry and Jean leaves to cherish in their memories, their little sister, Shalanda, Larry's nephew and Jean's sons, Ethan, which is 15 and Markel seven, their grandmother, Joyce Riley, with a host of cousins, family, friends, and loved ones. Of course, their mom, me. Please help us ease the pain like many other families that are in mourning due to the loss of their loved ones. We all seek count, excuse me, we all seek closure. With prayers, we're striving each day to live, survive, and seek peace. Larry and John's Riley family, thanks you for thanks you. Thank you for listening and having a listening ear. Again, we're requesting your support in this sensitive matter. God blessing be upon you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riley. And as the mayor said, you have our condolences. And uh, I think that if you will contact his office, he'll be able to give you more direction. Yes. I am mayor. Yeah. Um, Doug Schaefer. Is Doug still here? Uh, and lastly on our list is Brad Lemon. Good afternoon. Uh, tomorrow's board meeting, um, because it's a, it's a, uh, business session, I won't get an opportunity to address some things, so I thought I'd better do it today. I provided a uh, command with a list of uh, 11 area police departments, all our size or nearly our size, you know, a little bit smaller. Of the 11, we're number 11 in pay in starting. Um, 
That's impossible for us to recruit when we're recruiting from people that are just absolutely devastating us. In fact, most some of these have uh, $10,000 signing bonuses, $8,000 retention bonuses, take home car programs. The, what they have in place is not un, is unlike anything that we have here uh, to compete against. That's impossible. Uh, this year, as, as Deputy Chief Hicks said, uh, we're, we're experiencing record number of losses. We're going to continue to do that. We think there's between 25 and 35 people more that are going to leave. Um, I would uh, I would say that I think he's uh, incorrect in, in 1995 numbers. I think we're probably going to be closer to 1990 or 1989 numbers, 30 to 32 year lows. Uh, I would lo have you look at, well, you're making some of these decisions, tab E, in your board book under page five. If you'll look at, at some of those as, as you have these conversations, you'll see that uh, there's a huge number of people not only that are eligible to retire now, but eligible to retire next year uh, and the year after. Well, you look behind the, the, the five-year number that's behind them is incredibly small. What we're talking about is not just this year's losses and not next year's problems. We're talking about a five-year problem. If we can't get recruiting today, there are future boards, future command staffs, and, and, and men and women of rank and file that are going to pay an incredible price to, for our failures to be able to fund this police department. We cannot continue to lose people at the rate we're losing and not be able to recruit. At some point, we're, we got to quit having these conversations where the command staff, you know, and the board of police commissioners and the city council and the mayor and everybody's just fighting amongst each other. Well, we're bleeding out rank and file. There's got to be a conversation of how we're going to pay the men and women that are still here and how we're going to keep them. You know, I, I got an analogy for you. I don't care how much water you pour into a bottle. If it's filled with holes and we can't retain it, then what the heck are we doing? And we're not retaining people. I mean, this year alone, just this year, we averaged 27 people in the last eight years. This is what I track. Eight years, we've averaged 27 people leave outside of retirements. This year alone, we're at uh, 47, 47. And we're, not, we're in October. We're almost double what we've ever had. We're losing them to other industries. We're losing to other police departments. We're losing talent. So if we're going to recruit, that's fine. But in a recruiting nightmare across the entire country, we have, if we cannot keep up with the recruiting, we have to do something to keep up with retention. Three years without a COLA. Three years our top-down officers have not gotten a COLA. But every single year we've had a, we've had a, a, a increase in our, in our health care. We're bringing home less money today than we did three years ago. People are bailing from this police department. Our average retirement age, our retirement is 26.3 years. That means we're keeping people so short that they're just they're leaving immediately. Redact the command staff out of that. We're at like 22, 25 years and like six months for re retirees, officers and sergeants. Something has to change. You, we have to have a relationship. We have to quit fighting in public. I'm getting tech, my text, my phone's blowing up saying these are the people that we're, we're going to ask for money. These are people that are making decisions on their own livelihood, how they're going to pay their bills, give their family uh, insurance. And people are saying, why would I stay here? I'm just saying we can continue to sue each other and, and take for, and, and defund or whatever you want to call it and file state and state bills. We can do all this stuff all day long. But the men and women that have to make a decision that don't want to be command staff, that don't want to do anything, that just want to be great cops are going to make decisions to go elsewhere. And we got to stop it. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Chief Smith, general discussion from the uh, chief. Um, well, let's let's tackle the first one, the airport policing discussion. As you know, for several years, we have tried to maintain a presence at KCI um, to have a police uh, presence up there. Um, as we reviewed staffing for our North and Shoal Creek Patrol divisions, our um, our staffing is down. 13 officers at Shoal Creek and down 11 at North Zone. Um, it now becomes time to start looking about reallocating our airport officers back into regular patrol duties at our patrol division due to um, a lack of staff. Um, obviously, our two divisions up north are probably the least staffed. They also cover the most mileage. It also means that when we have the officers up there, it takes them longer to respond to calls. Um, again, it's a, it's, it's, personnel led driven um, need for the police department. So I would like to reallocate um, 
the on special assignment, move that airport police back into the divisions of both North and Shoal Creek. And then while we go through the budget discussions, hopefully we can come to some resolution about KCI. I thought we voted on that last meeting, Chief, and gave you the authorization to do that. Uh, you did, and the, the officers have been told, and and it will will happen at the pay period when we have the natural break. So that will occur um, on Sunday. So um, the other point of discussion is I know we had, um, and I was supposed to bring this up uh, last month, and I apologize. Uh, I was reminded I forgot. Uh, <laughs> I uh, We were talking about the prosecutor drug policy. We had presentations by Jackson County and presentations by uh, Clay and Platt County's uh, prosecutors about you know, how we should handle drug crimes um, within this police department and across the city. Um, so I, I know the board had the presentation, so I think it would be up to the board to comment on those, on those two presentations and to see if you wanted to give any direction. Uh, I don't know if this needs to be in the form of a motion to give direction to you, but it's my understanding, and actually someone said it earlier today, our job is to enforce the laws, not make them, not change them. And while some people may think that we can choose which laws to enforce or not, we don't. So I think our department needs to enforce the laws that we've been assigned to enforce. And we can't give our officers a requirement to enforce laws in Jackson County and then not do it in Clay and Platt or wherever. So my motion would be our department is to enforce the laws of the state of Missouri. Okay, we need a motion. I, I don't think you do. I, I think you can just, the board's pleasure. I, I, I think this- That's my pleasure. Yeah. yeah. I, I think this police department, as we talked with command staff, we agree with that, that it would be too hard to train our officers to do two types of policing in two different counties. That it, there's, we believe it would be all kinds of conflict and, and potential legal ramifications in the end. So we agree with that, with your assessment, that we should be consistent as a police department, um, no matter where the geography is. You need anything more from us? I might because you know it's been a long meeting and it's it's worthy of the conversation it, to assume arguendo the points raised by the Jackson County prosecutor who all know it is elected and I still do respect that she won an election and gets to do this for another three and a half years I, I believe one of her contentions um, wasn't so much that we just won't do drug cases it's the type and so there was a representation somewhere that the department, and I believe there was disagreement here, that the department has brought her a number of by bust cases. I believe the discussion from the department was that we don't actually do by bust cases. That's correct. Well, I, one of the examples, I, I, one of the examples in the presentations that I had, and I don't know if it was here where we were at city council chambers when we had it, was one ecstasy pill. That was a domestic violence call, I believe, in which the party was arrested and had an ecstasy pill. Well, search upon arrest of that and the department and the officer charged that case. And, and that's not a buy bus situation. That was, again, a citizen's call for help that we responded to. And this is what happened during the arrest. Understood. Um, and so what I would kind of take as a caveat, and this is just Quentin's thought, and just like you've heard others, um, it seems like we are moving in a direction where we actually do often find either we're arresting for drug offenses because there is that nexus to neighborhood nuisances, violent people, folks with a propensity to violence, or frankly, in something that every first year law student learns about a search incident to a lawful arrest. If, if you happen to have a bunch of drugs in your pocket and you're speeding, you know, that's that's just unfortunate for you, but you 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 will also be charged for, or at least you'll be written up for the drugs in your pocket as well. That's correct. The, the police, as we have talked, this police department is, you know, our major focus is violent crime to begin with. You know, then things work off of that. But as, as you participated in shoot review and you know the effort that we put into what we what we are trying to pull is the violent crime and trigger pullers in our city to try and stop 
shootings in the city. Now, there's some things that come off of that, obviously, and narcotics is part of that, and, and sometimes that's used. But if we think we're going out and, and officers on a daily basis are going out and looking for you know, marijuana or other things that low level offenses, that's not what's going on. I mean, officers come across things as they do their business, but that is not their focus of their daily activity. Understood, thank you. So I think uh, between the mayor and, and Commissioner Dean, that, that settles it. All right, all right, anything else, Chief? No, sir, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, approval of open session minutes for September 28th. Move approval. All in favor okay. by signing by. Aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. Uh, David Kenner, lobbying agreement with Arnold and Associates. Yes, uh, Andy Arnold has been the uh, department's lobbyist for many years. I think everybody's been quite satisfied with the job he's doing. This is a renewal of his contract at the same rate as he's been doing for the last several years would be at the rate of $51,000 per year uh, plus $7,500 for his expenses. So move. Second. All in favor by signing by? Aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. Anything else, David? No, thank you. Not this time. All right. Mayor Lucas? Uh, a few different points. First, I, I want to um, I commend several folks who received honors during the uh, Kansas City Metropolitan Crime Commission event. Uh, that includes Officer Bame, who we saw earlier today, uh, who will be retiring at the end of this week. That also uh, involves the police chief receiving the Clarence Kelly Award, a high honor, and you're to be commended for your service to the city and uh, that recognition. Um, I, I want to note a few things. I, I will, and I, I was not here, I and mean, you're not here, you don't get to vote on things. On airport policing, uh, I just, some disappointment. I know that's been a conversation for a number of years, started by uh, my predecessor, the, the preceding city manager and others, uh, as to how we can look to have better collaboration there. I think this department is very well prepared for uh, major incidents and threats to whether they be train stations, bus terminals, airport terminals, and beyond. And so I would hope at some point in the future, we're able to get all of those situations figured out. I will note that in some ways, that's not really the department here. I think some of our airline partners and others um, had qualms with a high quality of policing services, which cost money. Uh, and I would expect as a passenger of many of those airlines, they would actually make those investments as they do at a number of other airports in the country, but look not to do so here. Um, and then I guess um, other than that, I'll just, I've talked a lot, so I'll leave it at that. And we'll look forward to our conversation tomorrow. Thank you, Bishop. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kramer, anything for today? All right. Thank you. Commissioner Wagner? No, nothing else. All right. Commissioner Dean? No, thank you. All right. Um, I, I did want to mention that uh, as we go through these budget talks tomorrow, I, I hope that we come with an open mind and, um, you know, because I, I, I think there are always solutions. We've just got to be on the same page looking for the solution to best protect and serve our city. And so I... Um, I hope that as we come in tomorrow, uh, we lay all our, our armor down at the door and uh, come in and try to find a, a working solution uh, to make our city safer and get uh, more officers recruited. Um, I would ask, do we have a PR firm? I know that we have inside uh, media uh, when I look at all of the great things that are going on in these uh, presentations that we've had today, um, that information falls on just a few ears. And, and I think that part of goodwill is, is what's spread. And, you know, whenever there is a, a shooting or whenever there is somebody who is attacked, that gets spread, but the good news uh, stays very quiet. So I would like for us to look into uh, making sure that we have a professional PR firm that helps to spread the good news, which also brings goodwill.
to this department. So, um, and I'm sure that'll cost us some money. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. That's too. the budget. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I think we have to to have a motion to go out of closed I, and or I, out I, of I public move, into closed. I move that we adjourn this public meeting and go into closed session. All in favor? Roll call. Roll, Roll call. Second. Luke, uh, second and Lucas, aye. Wagner, aye. Dean, aye. Albert, aye. Kramer, aye. All right. And then do we have to have a motion to go into close? I just did. I no. was in the same we motion. Did same motion. All right. Thank you all. You're teaching me to get this down.